Hello, dear guests. Uh, we are in a building that is kind of divisive between architecture lovers. And I find it very uh, interesting that we're here and fitting that we're here to talk about bridging our, com our common gaps. So with that, it's my great pleasure to open the second day of the Presidency Conference on Gender Equality organized by the Office of Czech Government. My name is Andrzej Trhoň and I will be your moderator today. It's really great that so many of you offline and online have decided to join us today here in Prague. We live in a time of many challenges, many of those that Union has never faced before, and those will shape the future of tomorrow. It is the inc incomplete recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, Russian military aggression in Ukraine, energy poverty, refugee crisis and the climate crisis. And the impacts of those will affect our lives for many, many years to come. Also, this will be the future that the young generation will live in. And that's why, our, why we are here. And I'm glad that so many of you have decided to come and help us think about the possible way out, ways out. We are here to debate the impacts of current socio-economic challenges from the gender equality perspective, as well as from the perspective of young people. The year 2022 is also the European Year of Youth. So we would like to facilitate a dialogue with the young generation and address challenges that young people face today so we can achieve the union of equality tomorrow. Young people value diversity and inclusion as one of the key factors driving their career decisions. And I'm sure it's not only their careers, but also their lives and just like every day everyday existence. So we will also discuss a position of people with multiple disadvantages. The pandemic and current conditions negatively affect women and youth, particularly their working conditions and mental health. So it's great, again, to see you all here to think about the possible solutions. <clears throat> but now it's my honor to welcome here Klara Shimachkova, Laurenčíková, Government Commissioner for Human Rights. The floor is yours. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to open the second day of the Czech Presidency Conference on Gender Equality today and address you from my position of Government Commissioner for Human Rights. Yesterday, the conference was opened by several high-level speakers, including the Vice President of the European Commission, Viera Jourová, uh, or the Czech Deputy Prime Minister, Ivan Bartosz. Yesterday, we discussed various issues from economic recovery to green transition and energy poverty, protection and integration of refugees and labour and care. All of the experts agreed that gender mainstreaming is needed in adapting and implementing policies related to the socio-economic challenges we continue face. I personally participated in the seminar on integration and support of Ukrainian women and girls. Providing help to those fleeing from war Ukraine is my personal priority. I strongly believe we need to take into account specific needs of women and children as well as other disadvantaged groups of migrants and asylum seekers. The seminar confirmed that measures adopted at the EU as well as at national level must be gender sensitive, mainly in the area of housing, healthcare, labour market integration or education. Speakers also stressed the need to prevent all forms of sexual exploitation and human trafficking. It was also stressed that enhanced cooperation with civil sector is needed, mainly NGOs providing help on the ground. Many other important topics were discussed yesterday. For instance, speakers recognized the different impacts of climate change on women and men and provided suggestions on how to tackle energy poverty in a gender-sensitive way. 
The panelists also agreed that women and marginalized voices were left out of some national recovery plans and that many national recovery plans lacked an intersectional perspective. A set of recommendations on how to improve the situation was provided. All of the high-level speakers and panelists agreed that challenges connected to the impacts of the war in Ukraine, digitalization and green transition will shape Europe for future generations. Therefore, I am happy that today we will address the topic of gender equality mainly from the perspective of young generation. Topics such as the future of work, multiple discrimination, the role of education systems and diversity will be discussed today. I'm glad that we are joined by experts from various EU countries as well as youth organizations and civil sector. Let me thank you for joining us for today's conference and I wish you a fruitful debate. Thank you. And the first question or issue we will be dealing with in our first panel is the future of work. And the panel discussion will be facilitated by Ms. Lenka Do, Lenka Do, I'm sorry, a spokesperson of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Czech Republic. Lenka will be joined by Mr. Ki Beom Kim, employment policy specialist and co-author of the Global Employment Trends for Youth Report, International Labour Organization, Ms. Sharka Humphrey, Trade Union of State Bodies and Organizations, Czech Republic, Ms. Uh, uh, Rita Yevdokimova, European Youth Parliament, Ms. Irene Riobu Leston from European Institute for Gender Equality, and, and Ms. Radka Maxova, member of the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality European Parliament, who will join us online. So, without further ado, uh, in this exciting lineup, Lenka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Perdon. Uh, uh, great to be here. I'm uh, the spokesperson of the Czech MFA and also the chief of staff, so great to be here. Um, lately, I've been involved a lot in uh, women in diplomacy. We have a special campaign at our ministry as well, which is actually, I think, the reason why I'm here. What a great company to be in. Um, I think there are two speakers who are joining us uh, online. Is that correct? Ms. Uh, Maxova and uh, Mr. Kim. I, I was told that's correct. Okay. <laughs> Um, first, without further ado, I will keep you along. Of course, you're here to uh, hear, hear what the, those great speakers uh, have to say. So I think uh, Sharka will start with you and I'll give the floor to you and you have five minutes for your opening remarks. Okay, uh, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Great, good morning. Uh, I didn't quite expect to be first, but I suppose somebody has to do that. So, and I seem to be the only one coming from here, being here at home, I may as well start. Um, as has been mentioned, I'm a member of a trade union. I'm a lawyer. I work for a trade union of uh, state bodies and organizations, but I also hold a few more positions in the Czech trade union. Some, among other functions, I uh, serve as uh, the deputy chairperson of uh, Chumako's uh, Gender Equality Committee, and I'm also a member of the Women's Committee of uh, uh, the European Trade uh, Union Confederation. I see one of my colleagues in in, in here, which is very nice. So, uh, among other things, I do have a close uh, approach to uh, the gender aspects of uh, the labor market. Um, one of the questions I've been asked to talk about in the beginning is the current role of the trade unions, especially with regards to future of work and uh, uh, gender aspects of labor market. Even after a more than 100 years history of trade unions and labor movement, our role has certainly not diminished and our work is not done. Trade unions still have the main task of representing workers, defending their rights and vocalizing their needs, especially those most fragile and marginalized ones that otherwise wouldn't have been heard. 
The biggest Czech trade union confederation, Chemokos, has been one of the first big actors in the critical national debate over future of work and the so-called fourth industrial revolution. Uh, you came here to Czech Republic to a very, very techno-optimistic country, sometimes a bit too, op too techno-optimistic for my taste, and uh, I am uh, actually really proud to be a member of the organization that was one of the first to um, raise a critical voice, as in what is the digital future of work going to bring us. Um, unlimited techno-optimism can lead to overlooking serious risks and creating new groups of fragile and precarious workers and other economically active people, even more so amongst young people entering the job market. Uh, but it's not only the digital revolution that's shaping the job markets of tomorrow, there are other megatrends affected it that shall not be forgotten. One of the looming crises is the so-called crisis of care that is closely connected to the de demographic um, trends of the national population. Um, in general, the population is growing older, less children are uh, less children are being born and people live longer and longer, which uh, during the COVID times uh, has proven that uh, it is the care sector, education, social care and, uh, uh, and the health sector that uh, will need to be more robust than ever in the future. That is one of the lessons we should have, uh, according to the trade union, we should have carried over from the COVID times, whether we have or not, that is a question that should be really discussed. That brings me to the realm of public empo employment, which is the scope of my trade union. Um, we do not think that the lesson that I mentioned has been learned appropriately. Many politicians and a part of the general public still considers the public sector merely issue of unnecessary public spending and the public employees as somebody who not working, but somebody else has to work to provide uh, their income. Robust public sector is not only important for the society actually functioning, but also provides a buffer against shocks and ripples across economy and job markets that could deepen social schisms and increase risk of, risks of radicalization and political extremism. That is something that we can see over the current demonstrations and that we also do believe that should not be underestimated. Another big topic is the digitalization of public service itself, rather a lack of it, that is uh, influencing the whole economy and uh, obviously the way people work. Still, more often than not, if it's ever discussed, it's more a buzzword than serious discussion. One well, my last remark would be on the note of gender. The future of work is gendered, obviously, just like everything else is gendered. And that affects platform work, care work, work in uh, academia, in technical position, and plainly just everyday working lives. One of the important tasks that we found is to stop pretending that job market is gender neutral, as some politicians, and again, part of public still does. In Czech Republic, one of the biggest challenges we should um, from the, point of, uh, from the point of view of young people we should be overcoming is the huge amount of precarization that's caused by motherhood. You may or may not know that uh, our parental, allow parental leave up to three or four years with each child is extremely long and while it is uh, certainly comfortable to be provided for good times when you take care of your family, it's also not that comfortable when you're actually trying to get back to the job market. Whenever I speak to young women, much younger women than I am, uh, you can tell that even before they have their own children, their uh, aspirations as when it comes to both career and family are affected by this looming threat of being simply put aside for way too many years, basically losing contact with the professions. As we have more and more women coming out from universities, this is something they're not necessarily would like uh, to see as part of their future lives. Yet, dogmas and ideologies still seem to be going strong and, again, whenever there is a discussion about how to, uh, how to enable, uh, especially young people, to um, 
more easily combine their uh, their work and personal lives, especially when it comes to working with little children. Not enough practical things are done from the point of view. I will leave it at this. I think I, mm, I opened maybe way too many topics, and I'm looking forward to the forthcoming discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sharika. Uh, great thought-provoking um, thoughts from you. Um, you, you see a uh, future of work in practice right now, so uh, we're able in this century to connect uh, remotely. Uh, I'll now give the floor to one of the speakers who are with us online. Um, Mr. Kim, uh, would you like to introduce uh, your work? Mr. Kim, can we hear you? Okay, what about we go to uh, Mrs. Uh, Maksova right now, uh, a member of the European Parliament. So the floor is yours for your opening remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, uh, I um, can say that this topic is very important also for European Parliament and uh, I am a vice president of FEM committee and we are discussing uh, future of work uh, very, very, uh, very much time. Dear all, I would like to focus uh, today on this topic of future work from a slightly different angle for me. The future of work is such that it will allow workers to flourish and enjoy a good work-life balance free of anxiety and burns out. Just to highlight the severity of this mental health pandemic, a uh, few numbers. Work-related stress in the second most reported work-related health problem in Europe. Mental health problems have become one of the leading causes of absenteeism from work and early retirement all of, over the European region. 88% of EU workers experience stress problems at work. Young people are up to four times more likely to experience depression or anxiety than adults with 64% of young people between 18 and 34 at risk of depression in 2021. I am afraid that if we do not act now, we will have a disaster brewing on our hands. This issue also has a gender dimension that cannot be overlooked. Prevalence of depression in the EU um, is 1.7 times higher in women than in men, and anxiety disorders are twice more prevalent among women. The incentive to tackle mental health issue and to support workers' work-life balance is not only of importance at the individual level, but also at the social one. The European economy loses 620 billion euros a year due to work-related depression, which accounts for more than 4% of our GDP. There are several reasons and possible solutions, but it is clear that gender stereotypes deeply in inequalities deeply rooted in our societies are one of the major drivers of those issues. Studies found that better gender equality results in better mental health for both men and women. So to answer the question, what is the future of work? I believe it is work that does not chew up employees, but allows, allows them to thrive in a friendly and encouraging environment. Mental health cannot be taboo not in our societies and not in the workplace. Mental health should be brought up and championed by, by employers as well as appropriate adjustment should be allowed for those who are suffering from a mental health issue. 
The current EU legislation and policies in this area do not address the growing crisis of mental health amongst our workplace. With many citizens now spending an excessive portion of their lives due to digitalization, which was even more accelerated by the pandemic, connected to work remotely, this has continued to contribute to negative mental health through job burnout, harassment, lack of work-life balance. It is of most importance that workers can expect a proper level of protection for both their physical and mental well-being. Digital, remote work has many, many advantages, but the current legislation needs to be updated to respond to the new realities. And lastly, I would like to mention care. Women still have to main load of care responsibilities. 90% of the formal care workplace workforce is made up of women. And 7.7 .7 million women have responsibilities. 80% of women stated that they are not in employment because they are unable to combine employment and care obligations, in contrast to half percent of men. I am happy that we finally have the Work-Life Balance Directive and that the European Commission has just recently published the care strategy, which both address this issue. But we need to do two more especially in regard to informal care. For women, for, for uh, work doesn't stop when they leave the office, but often it only means their informal care work only begins. With no time for themselves and for mental health self-care. We have to do more to tackle inequalities and mental health issues. This will not only lead to happier and better employees, but also to better efficiency. And we can save a lot of money that we are currently losing due to mental health. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Maksova, uh, for joining us this remotely as well. We'll now get back to the floor here. And uh, we have uh, Rita here with us. Rita is the delegate of the European Youth Parliament. I've, heard, I've read some stats that say that about 25% of the world population are young people who are not involved in future decision making very often. So maybe you can elaborate even further. Yes, hello everyone, good morning. Um, yes, my name is Rita. Uh, I'm a young professional myself, if I can, if I can say so myself. Um, I come from Latvia, I am 24 years old, and uh, my educational background is in intercultural communications, uh, but currently I work as a human resources manager at a global tech company. Um, so in my everyday life, I also work with quite a lot of young people, and I work with a lot of aspects of digitalization, um, but here, yes, I'm mainly representing the European Youth Parliament, um, which is an organization that is very dear to my heart. Uh, I've been part of it for the past seven years. Um, and to maybe gi give a brief description of the organization, it's um, non-governmental, it's apolitical, it's apartisan, and it's mainly focused on education. Uh, what is important about our organization is that it is run by young people and it is run for young people. Um, so we organize everything ourselves. Um, we hold around 500 events every single year, um, and these events gather around 30,000 participants also every single year. And the organization is represented in 40 different countries, so it's not only the European Union, but also countries in Europe that are outside the EU. Um, so, you know, it is a very large network of young people. And outside of these standard format conferences that we organize, we also try very much to be involved in policy making in every sort of way we can. Uh, so we have projects outside of conferences um, that focus on climate change, on human rights, um, on various different issues um, that Europe is facing. Um, and one such project took place throughout last year, which was called Young Opinions on the Future of Europe. So it was part of the Future of Europe conference. It was um, sort of in connection to back then it 
was still the upcoming year of youth. Um, and essentially what we did is we had 24 young people from our network who came together. We met up three different times. Um, these 24 people were all from different countries, different backgrounds, different minority groups. Um, and we created, have it with me, we created this youth vision booklet. It looks uh, small, but it contains quite a lot of information. And uh, what we did is that we um, sort of analyzed the work that has been done in the European Youth Parliament conferences. And we also conducted this huge youth poll that gathered um, around a thousand respondents, both within our organization and outside. Um, a lot of young people responded on their views on the future of Europe, again, on very different topics, starting from climate change, democracy, human rights, uh, the energy crisis, um, as well as employment. And the reason I am here today is because I was part of the working group on the future policies on employment and working conditions, together with Cameron, who is also sitting in the audience today. Um, and um, through our analysis of the poll and of the work that the European Youth Parliament has done, we created this uh, vision that is essentially just one small page, uh, but it has, again, quite a lot of information on what young people think should be the future of employment. And maybe to summarize it, it starts with a mission statement that says that we envision a Europe where the EU places financial, social and personal well-being of workers at the center of its employment policies. So, you know, a very broad uh, vision, but then it has five priority areas um, that were mentioned mostly in the poll. Uh, number one is prioritizing social welfare and working conditions of all workers. So that again includes gig workers and platform workers that were already mentioned. Uh, number two was tackling impacts of digitalization, which again, the youth poll took place last year, so already during the pandemic when digitalization um, continued and became an even bigger thing. Um, so things like the right to disconnect that we're going to discuss today is mentioned there as well quite a lot in the working time directive. Um, number three priority was ensuring that we address the skill shift that is happening and also modernize education systems. So in general, throughout this big poll that we analyzed, education was mentioned a lot. We could also see regional differences in the way people mention education and the way it differs between different countries and how it impacts future employment possibilities for people based on where they come from. Um, number four priority was supporting the upskilling and reskilling efforts uh, through different, you know, targeted things such as paid internships, very targeted training campaigns that also, you know, support women, for example, uh, and their future employment possibilities. And number five, last but definitely not least, is ensuring that we create equal opportunities for all workers, regardless of their gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, and so on. Um, so obviously that has always been very important before the pandemic and also now for young people. Um, I do want to mention some other key things from this youth poll. So, for example, more than a half of respondents said that generating a healthy and balanced workplace should be the top priority of the EU. So, when they were asked on top of their heads what the EU's economy should be concerned about, like more than 500 people said that it is youth employment or also youth unemployment. Um, and then also one in five of young Europeans who responded to the survey um, said that ensuring employment opportunities and fair conditions is extremely relevant for the future of Europe. Um, so we saw a lot throughout the survey that it concerns young people. Um, what is also important is that um, a lot of respondents were still students or people who are just entering the workforce. Um, so I cannot necessarily, you know, represent all young Europeans. And uh, it was also interesting for us to analyze what people think who are still not employed, but soon to be employed, or at least trying to get um, an entry level position, let's say. Um, and yeah, then to wrap up, um, I'm here to sort of draw conclusions from the work we did last year. We also met up with policymakers in Brussels, with members of the European Parliament, uh, with policymakers from the European Commission. We got their feedback on our visions. And then now in conferences like this one, uh, we're very glad to be part of and like continue our work and continue to spread the word. And I'm also happy to share my own opinion because I do, again, work with young people in the digital sphere. Uh, I, I discuss a lot of these issues with them as well. Uh, so yeah, glad to be part of this and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. We'll now get back to our speakers online. Uh, so Mr. Uh, Kim Kebom, if you can hear me, this time uh, the floor is yours for opening remarks. Um, yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Um, no. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can't see you because uh, your presentation just opened. Right. So, um, 
So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I do have a, a, I did prepare a presentation. I see uh, other speakers have not, but since I have, uh, I have pre uh, prepared it, I will go through it relatively quickly. Uh, well, I was asked to provide the, the presentation about 10 minutes. So I'll try, I'll try and you know, keep to those uh, 10 minutes. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Ki uh, Kibon Kim. I'm an uh, employment and macroeconomic uh, specialist with the ILO uh, based in Geneva. And let me first congratulate the Czech presidency on this very important um, uh, conference. I was hoping to be there and I was scheduled to be there uh, for the conference personally, but unfortunately I've been traveling quite a bit and I actually uh, uh, contracted COVID actually. So um, I, uh, I was not able to travel uh, and I'm here instead. But thank you very much uh, for this opportunity uh, uh, particularly to the ILO and during the European Year of Youth uh, 2022 in particular to provide a few uh, uh, messages based on some of our latest research, which is the Global Employment Trends for Youth 2022 report, which was launched about uh, about, a, about a month ago. A month ago. So let me just start with some uh, some headline messages. And, and it's that, uh, that first that young people have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, youth unemployment levels have come down from their from the highs in 2020, but are still uh, higher than the pre-pandemic benchmark. Uh, we see a rising number of youth not in education, employment or training or, or needs as they're commonly called. And so this uh, potential for this lockdown for some commentators called the lockdown generation to be scarred. Uh, there are also, of course, significant differences by gender as well as between uh, uh, youth and adults. And we do, uh, although, of course, this is a, uh, but we do, you know, for example, find great opportunities for employment growth for young people in five promising sectors. I will go in particular detail into the digital economy, because I think that's an area that this panel would like to look into a bit more, uh, into a bit more depth. And, and lastly, one of the lessons I think that we've learned in terms of policy response is that the policy response really needs to pay more attention on its distributional aspect. We found, for example, that many uh, youth programs were not youth specific, as, you know, the stimulus programs uh, that were enacted as a result of the pandemic. And this has, of course, exacerbated inequalities both within countries uh, and across countries. So my presentation is, is divided into three broad areas. First, I will look into the global and regional trends and speak a little bit about Eastern Europe as well in terms of the regional trends. Uh, you know, speak about the digital economy, some of the characteristics that we have uh, and trends that we have, uh, you know, found as part of our research on this report, and then wrap up with a few policy recommendations. So in terms of the, in terms of the, uh, the global picture, there's some 1.2 billion people between the ages of 15 and 24 globally. Um, and most of these, or 60%, are out of the labor force. So they're not participating in the labor force, whereas about 30, uh, 33% or about 408 million people are employed globally. So uh, in terms of unemployment, uh, that level, as I mentioned, has come down, but it does, there were still 6 million uh, people, young people more than, you know, than the pre-pandemic benchmark. And young people have been affected more, as have young women. Let me come back to some of these uh, deep, uh, more in, in more details. And just to, in terms of the background, we have to also, I think, bear in mind that there are, you know, almost a, more than a quarter of, uh, of young people globally around the world are living in households that are, you know, that, you know, are not earning enough to lift themselves or their families out of the poverty line, whether that's at the you know extreme poverty line or the moderate poverty line. Of course, uh, now we have uh, you know th there's a p potential recession around the globe, you know, slowing, uh, including slowing growth in China, and so this of course is very negative repercussions on uh, on working poverty around the world. And uh, and uh, we and also most young people. Uh, you know, 77% in 2017, that's when we have the latest data, are in informal employment. So um, against that backdrop, we have found that the employment to um, population ratio, the EPR, as we say, has been decreasing over decades. But as you can see from this line, the gender gap has really not decreased too much over time. Also, during the pandemic, we have seen that young women have been particularly disproportionately, so I say, uh, impacted by the by the COVID-19 pandemic. You can see, for example, that in the first year of the pandemic in 2020, employment of young women fell by minus 
8.1% compared to minus 6.8% for women. And the recovery, as you can tell from the figures in 2022 and 2021, are also lagging, uh, also lagging for young women. <clears throat> in addition, um, we have the need weights that, you know, in the latest data that we have, which is for 2020, uh, we find that, uh, you know, need weights have risen. And of course, this has uh, negative implications, of course, on the SDG target to substantially reduce the proportion of youth, not employment, education, training. And we've seen, um, at least in, in relation to the need weight, we, we have seen over the past decades uh, a large, but at least, uh, you know, decreasing uh, gender gap. But it's important to emphasize that at least you know one in five uh, or one in four young uh, women or young people around the world continue to be in this need status. <clears throat> so when do we expect uh, one of many of these youth labor market indicators to come back to pre-crisis uh, levels? I think the uh, the impact of what we saw during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, as illustrated in this graph here, really provides some answers. And we find, for example, that the bars illustrate uh, the unemployment rates for, for adults, or actually not for adults, but for, the, for all workers. And, we, and you see, for example, that in, 20, in 2009, unemployment really decreased, uh, increased quite a lot, but then sub, sub, you know, subsequently decreased. On the other hand, youth unemployment rates um, you know, did not we continue to remain elevated, as you can see from this line graph here, and you know before it ends and remained elevated until the COVID-19 pandemic hit. So, of course, this high levels of whether unemployment, underemployment, inactivity, or employment in either inf informality or in working poverty has really, you know, risks this risk scarring from, you know, risk scarring. And I think some of this uh, scarring can be uh, is illustrated in this graph that shows uh, it, people in Germany, this is for Germany, who have been, uh, you know, the earnings of those who, have, who were displaced and not displaced. So you can see the blue glass is actually that of the non-displaced people, whereas the, uh, where the red line is for those displaced. And you can see that, you know, after displacement, the earning gap continues to, to be there, even 15 years until after the initial period of displacement. So, and of course, there is, uh, let me just talk briefly about some of these gender and age inequalities. In Eastern Europe, for example, circled here by the red line, we see the youth employment to population ratios. Here, I think two things I would like to highlight. The first is that gender gaps in Eastern Europe are not as wide as some other regions as illustrated in this graph. On the other hand, we can see that youth employment to population ratios are generally low at 23% uh, are low relative to, for example, those found in Northern, Southern or Western Europe, which is at, for example, 36% uh, for women. Uh, when we look at need rates, for example, one area we do find that, you know, need rates in uh, Eastern Europe are much lower um, than in other regions as our gender, uh, as our gender wage gaps. And I, but I think that also it's important to highlight that in terms of need rates, uh, need rates for men, young men are generally driven by the availability or the unavailability of job opportunities, whereas for female need rates, these are you know largely driven by structural barriers to entering uh, advanced education or the labor market. So there, so the need to really address um, these issues. So in terms of uh, youth unemployment rates, you can see here that the blue graph, the blue, blue bar is really the increase in the youth uh, unemployment rate, which is much higher than that for the adult, uh, in, with the increase in the adult youth unemployment rate, which is depicted by the red line. And also, as a result, you know, uh, youth unemployment rates are about three times higher uh, than that of uh, than that for adults, which is around the global average. So at the same time, there are opportunities to uh, report highlights to increase youth employment. Uh, some of these areas include uh, the green economy, the blue economy, or the marine economy, the platinum economy, or it's, should we say the digital economy, the orange economy, the creative economy, and as well as the purple and care um, economies. And these are also you know, aligned with some of the discussion of the G7 and the three Ds, including um, that are reshaping labor markets, including that the digitalization, decarbonization, and demographic uh, change. And so we do a number of simu simulation, uh, macroeconomic simulations, and we find that, for example, uh, you know, investments into the green, digital, and care uh, sectors can really, put, you know, upset, you know, increase. Um, Youth employment levels and set economies in a path to resilience, um, inclusiveness, 
and inclusiveness and sustainability. So let me just uh, come to the issue of uh, digital employment briefly uh, before my time is up. And so we've looked into 28 high, middle, and low-income countries. And we find, you know, most I think these are well-known. So first, that this thing intensity increases as one moves from agriculture to industry and then from industry to services. And that this you know, employment is typically concentrated in urban areas. And this is particularly the case in low and middle income countries where oftentimes this still infrastructure is limited to urban areas. And perhaps the, one of the most surprising findings here is that women, particularly young women, are slightly more likely than men to be in digital employment. Uh, in high income countries, however, such in the Czech Republic, young women continue to, uh, young men, I'm sorry, young men continue to account for a greater share of of uh, high discipline, high discipline intensive employment than young women. <clears throat> and youth employment in this economy is characterized by the relatively high proportion of skilled workers as well. And this employment, perhaps this is also a bit more surprising, is that we find that it goes hand in hand with, with wage employment as well as uh, formalization. So in many European countries, um, including Eastern Europe, we find that the share of young workers undertaking task-based work or gig work or platform-based work, as is uh, commonly defined, is that the share of these workers, young workers, are twice that of adults. Um, but at the same time, these young, work, young workers are more likely than their older counterparts to be working, uh, you know, working uh, full-time as opposed to part-time for adults. Also, um, young people tend to earn wage, hourly, hourly wages, which are higher than those of older workers. But this is purely because of a learning to learning by doing effect. And, and young people and this and young people in general are able to learn much quicker. And, and hence, as you can see from this graph, after a subsequent year, one year of learning, uh, their returns to uh, their returns to experience is substantially higher than that for uh, for adults. And in uh, and when we look at you know in a bit more in depth into car work, we find that uh, that basically essentially the returns to edu to education from in crowd work are zero. And what really matters here are learning by doing. Uh, so as I mentioned before, that's really what drives uh, the returns to educate um, uh, the you know uh, uh, the returns for young people. Um, and also, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly here, and I think that's probably, be, we'll be discussing this quite a bit, young women's wage rates in cart work are around 20% lower than those for young men. But however, in, in theory, of course, this AI biases can happen, but in theory, these tasks are supposed to be anonymous. So um, in theory, these are not due to labor market discrimination, but rather that because uh, based on our research that young women are actually willing to work on average for lower wages than equally qualified men. Um, and one, of course, the many challenges in, in terms of job or income security that you know people in crowd work face. But one, one uh, is that one other challenge is that, that I would like to highlight is that they have a challenge validating the experience and bargaining for higher wages. So though these platforms collect different, uh, in fact, a myriad of performance uh, metrics, uh, these these it's not easy to translate these metrics into portable documentation to demonstrate skills and experience. So let me just highlight, I've come to basically the last of my uh, uh, presentation, I'm, uh, but let me just highlight some, some, uh, some policy implications. The first is that where we want to get to is that we, because young people are more uh, you know, sensitive to the economic fluctuations, uh, we, 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 we're looking for, you know, we would advise countries to put in place counter-cyclical fiscal policies, economic and employment, you know, strengthen economic employment policies and invest in sectors that can create jobs. And I've mentioned some of these sectors. And the way to get there, of course, is through investment, education and training, including on core skills, uh, basic conditioning and green skills. Um, when I spoke about the youth uh, need rates being low in, in Europe, I think youth guarantees have really played an important role in that regard and the need to continue and strengthen that, as well as social protection and, as well, and, and other uh, employment policies. And of course, the need to, in, in all this setting, to, of course, um, you know, need to pay attention to the inclusiveness. So, uh, through, and, you know, through, for example, strengthening public employment services, occupational safety and health, uh, mental health being uh, was, was mentioned by my fellow panelists, that's critically important. As are the, you know, uh, the the critical need, um, uh, you know, to 
uh, to, to integrate youth rights and voices have been raised by other panel members. So thank you very much. Let me leave it at that and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's great that the international labor organizations are actually looking into this. Uh, last but not least, we have with us uh, Iran Riobo from the European Institute for Gender Equality. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for having invited uh, Ege uh, to participate in this panel. Um, I'm really uh, happy to be here to discuss with you today the new forms of uh, employment. As, as we, we all know, uh, digitalization and um, uh, artificial intelligence um, have an undeniable importance in today's society because uh, they are um, changing our world of work. They are introducing new forms of work. And uh, this can create new opportunities for gender equality, but at the same time, this can also uh, reinforce the already existing inequalities in the labor market, such, such as uh, discrimination or sexism, or um, uh, inequalities in relation to gender pay gap, uh, stereotypes, and so on. At the European Institute for Gender Equality, at EGE, we have extensively worked on this topic in the recent years, analyzing this phenomenon from different angles. And in this introduction, I want to present some findings from one of the latest reports uh, latest studies on artificial intelligence and platform work. This study is based on a um, panel, uh, online panel survey that we run in uh, 10 EU countries. And uh, we interviewed uh, almost 5,000 uh, platform workers. So the aim was to know who they are, uh, which um, are the challenges that they are facing, and why do they do platform work, and so on. To our knowledge, this is um, one of the biggest uh, EU surveys uh, in plat uh, focus on platform work. And uh, probably this is the only one that uh, has a gender perspective, that meaning that aims to analyze uh, the platform work uh, from the gender uh, dimension. Uh, regarding the results, well, uh, let's give a, a, a picture of the platform workers. Uh, our survey data shows that out of all platform workers, 58% are women and 42% are men. Also, the data shows that uh, in uh, the last years, the number of women participated in, in um, Sorry, I gave the percentage uh, in wrong. So it's in the other way around. The majority are men. 58% are men and 42% um, are women. Uh, but uh, we know that in the last years, the number of women uh, participating in the labor market is uh, increasing and, uh, and is um, accelerated also by the pandemic. And... Um, by the expansion of the digital forms of work. As regard uh, uh, other characteristics, other demographic characteristics of platform workers, we can say that most of them are young, are, are well educated, and they have care responsibilities. So the um, uh, average age of uh, uh, the platform workers is 31 uh, years and uh, this may raise certain concerns uh, for us because although platform work can be uh, a way to a way for, for the young people to enter the labor market and gain some experience um, for others uh, maybe a, a risk of getting entrapped into precarious work uh, regarding the education, uh, well, 47% of women and 41% of men working in platform work uh, have completed tertiary education. As um, we know, platform work 
frequently entails uh, low skills uh, activities, tasks. So these figures uh, mean that um, women are more likely to do uh, work, a work that uh, does not match um, their level of education. So women are more likely to lose skills. Regarding another uh, important aspect, uh, work-life balance or, or the care responsibilities of platform workers, we, um, we know that uh, some um, forms of platform uh, are highly flexible and they uh, support or, or um, uh, allow the, a good combination between paid work and unpaid work, right? Uh, but um, this is likely to support the women, women's participation in, in work, but um, maybe in some cases this kind of opportunities, what are doing is to reinforce the uh, unequal distribution of unpaid uh, work. Uh, for instance, uh, women are more likely uh, to um, uh, perform online tasks in platform work because they can combine the, the work in the platforms with care responsibilities at home. Um, when in fact they could benefit more if they would have access to, to proper uh, services or uh, if uh, they could be a uh, um, more balanced distribution of the unpaid care at home. Uh, on the other side, uh, uh, men are more likely to do platform work to top uh, uh, of uh, regular employment and to bring um, some extra money uh, at the household. And also this could prevent them to uh, spend more time with their children. So we have to um, be careful with uh, uh, the work-life balance uh, in this kind of um, uh, new types of uh, work. So also um, in, in the survey we see that uh, <coughs> One of the main motivations uh, for women to work in platform work is th that they think that this could uh, bring flexibility and it could be easier for them to combine their paid and unpaid work. But uh, in fact, uh, aside from an easy entry to, to, the, to, to, to the market, to the platform work, uh, we don't have evidence that supports that platform work gives flexibility uh, to, to have a, a better work-life balance. Uh, in, in fact, uh, most of the flat platform workers work at night, work during the weekends. Um, they also um, are unable to choose their working time and um, and their working hours are uh, scattered uh, throughout the day. In addition, uh, there is uh, an important penalty imposed by platforms for interrupted work, uh, who also uh, can detriment uh, the combination of paid and unpaid work. So, uh, once I, I have uh, given this picture of uh, the platform workers and the main challenges according to our uh, survey, uh, I, I want to stress that uh, is, it is in our hands uh, to um, avoid uh, the negative gender effects of these new forms of employment. We need to uh, include the gender dimension in uh, the labour market policies uh, in order to, to avoid the uh, a reinforcement or to avoid to, to perpetuate the already existing inequalities. So what we want are measures that uh, support the equal participation in, in these new forms of employment, both for women and men, and also measures that uh, improve their working conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I'm looking at the time here, and I think we'll jump right into questions uh, from uh, the audience. You can put your questions through a uh, slide as well, and if you ask the questions um, here, if you could raise your hand and introduce yourself and then tell us um, who uh, is your question for. Uh, so we already have some questions uh, uh, through Slido already, so I'll let you think about your questions for a while. Um, there's this first uh, question, which is um, very interesting. And of course, uh, many of us would like to know, what do you think would be the effect of the four-day week initiative on the labor market in terms of reaching gender equality? Um, I think, uh, Shark Humphrey, you're smiling, so we could start. <laughs> um, the question can be answered very simply. It depends. <laughs> because uh, a four-day week uh, is, um, it can be, uh, can be uh, introduced in many, many ways. It uh, depends with uh, how exactly it is set up. It depends on how it affects wages, and it also depends what the wages are to start with, in particular job market, in particular economy, and also in a particular um, profession. Um, in general, and that has been fairly proved uh, in, um, during the pandemic, we can tell that uh, when the working arrangement is more flexible, women and men use the flexibility differently. Typically, uh, women care more and men work even more. So uh, if uh, the four-day week initiative is not accompanied by other effective measures protecting or even lifting the wage policy and also um, with uh, measurements that help with the division of labor and care at home, typically with child care or care of uh, elderly uh, family members, then it may not necessarily help to reach uh, gender equality. It may actually deepen it, the inequality. So you think that giving people more freedom or more flexibility is better than to just um, say, you know, you work from Monday to Thursday. Are there any other thoughts? Maybe uh, Iren or Rita, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, partially. <laughs> I'd say that I do agree that it has to be enforced together with other policies, such as the right to disconnect. Um, and I think it comes very often with young people as well, is that they're very driven to prove themselves, they're very driven to grow fast, and they don't necessarily disconnect from work. And I feel like if the work week is shorter, there's still a lot of people, and it depends, of course, on the industry where they work, there's still a lot of people who would be working and putting extra work and it wouldn't necessarily change the situation and give them you know, more work-life balance. Um, addition, in addition to that, I do think it has to be researched more and tried out more. Um, in the youth poll, for example, as well, it was never mentioned by any of the respondents. I don't think people know enough about it to make an informed decision and to enforce it very strictly. Um, yeah, so those are my two cents. Thank you. Um, I think we'll go to the next question. If you have your questions, just raise your hand. Um, yes, we'll give the floor first to the lady in the red right here. Uh, do we have a microphone? Thank you. I also posted it on Slido, but hey, I'm moving ahead of the others. <laughs> I was speaking yesterday in the session on the green economy and I was really interested by the figures on the green economy that this is the area where new jobs can be created for young people. But I was wondering because my understanding was that we have a challenge with young women in the green economy because a lot of the jobs are in renovation, renewable energy, so very much linked to more technical and you know education and STEM education. So I wanted to find out from the trade unions and from Mr. Um, from the ILO um, in how far we, that is really also an area where we see young women and if not what should we do <laughs> thanks and who is your question for uh, ILO okay uh, so we'll give uh, the floor to uh, Mr. Kim first if uh, you hear us if you could answer the question yeah, so, so thank you very much uh, for the question. I think it's, uh, it's, it's something that, in fact, we have also uh, looked into quite a bit. And you're, you're right. I mean, uh, because some of the technologies that, will, uh, that are required 
you know, for the world to come to net zero are, are going to, are, in fact, some of them have not even been, um, you know, developed yet. And so, um, and we know, for example, that, uh, you know, for example, in the STEM fields, that women are severely underrepresented. And so um, it, I think in many aspects, yes, that is correct. I think the technology required to address some of these climate change issues, you know, are going to, uh, you know, are going to favor men more. But at the same time, I think we have to also bear in mind that uh, the transition to green, uh, you know, encompasses, it's it's the many, you know, transition pathways that are going to, that are going to be needed, including that of the energy transition as such, but also, you know, that of the circle economy. And for example, in the circle economy, uh, we find that, for, you know, that skill levels uh, may, are not as high as in other areas. And so, uh, you know, uh, so there are opportunities uh, for both, you know, not only for women, of course, but for, you know, underprivileged or less, you know, or from uh, young people in particular from less uh, advantageous backgrounds to be able to participate, um, you know, in the transition. But at the same time, uh, because it, the, the great focus will be on the new technologies that drive, you know, that drive this transition to net zero, I think there is a critical need, of course, to ensure that, you um, that youth are able to benefit, but also uh, young women. Let me let me just leave it at that uh, for now. Thank you. Sharka? Uh, just a very short remark. Um, the gender segregation on job market is preceded by gender segregation in education, and uh, specifically in uh, technological education, while the gender stereotypical approach to education starts at a very, very early age. Uh, that's something that should be tackled not only with connection to the uh, green uh, uh, technologies and green economy, but in general, and uh, specifically in Czech Republic, we are quite few steps behind on this debate. Thank you very much. I'll now um, read one of the questions from Slido, because I think we need to talk more about what the European Union can do. Um, so how can you motivate employers to give a chance to young workers, um, for example, recent graduates, as opposed to older, more experienced applicants for jobs? And I think this is a question for, uh, a question for a European Union um, uh, representatives. I think uh, Mrs. Uh, Radka Maksova could uh, answer this question, and maybe perhaps Rita as well. Uh, Mrs. Maksova first. It's not easy to answer uh, because uh, um, I um, agree that uh, base uh, on this is uh, education, not only education employees but also employers because uh, they need to know how good uh, young people we have and they need to cooperate with uh, schools, universities, and uh, try to um, increase maybe motivation program uh, of universities and try to pick up uh, the best uh, studies uh, of um, our um, uh, young people. Um, also, I think that here is very important uh, uh, trade union and um, discussion with uh, employees and um, the next steps uh, I'm not uh, really sure uh, what is uh, um, what is important maybe it is also a question of very good uh, work conditions uh, good behavior and work life balance because as um, I can speak with young people, for them are very important to have uh, good time in uh, his job and also enough time for their um, personal life. Uh, it is a question of future and um, I'm not sure if European Union can do a lot of uh, in this, uh, uh, but as I said, Education on both sides are very important. Thank you uh, very much, Rita. We have a lot of uh, young people uh, here with us. So what would you say to our future employers? Uh, see, I work in the private sector myself. And um, because it is 
a tech company, most of the people that come in are young. We offer paid internships. I think that is one very important aspect why young people even want to choose the employer is because they don't want to, they don't want essentially unpaid labor. Um, so I think it very greatly depends on the industry. So again, the technical sector is great in this regard. A lot of young people have a lot of knowledge. They learn faster and it is seen by many employers. But if we look, for example, I don't know, at teaching, um, like there are many industries like that where it's way more challenging. And I would agree definitely that education is important and a dialogue with companies and with employers should happen more often and more frequently. Um, I think also oftentimes policies on the European level are discussed within European policymakers and not with the private sector. Uh, the private sector and employers should be incentivized more um, to welcome young people. Um, and I think the more they start welcoming the young people, the more they'll see the benefits and it will you know, become a gradual increase over time. Okay, thank you. I think we have one more question from the audience here. Uh, there was a gentleman in the back. No? <laughs> Okay, oh, so we've answered already, efficient. Um, <laughs> uh, there is one question actually that we have to address because uh, on Slido we can see it multiple of times. Um, it's about uh, remote uh, working, um, flexible working can, and uh, uh, mental health. So how can organizations uh, policy help combat the always working uh, mental mentality and tendency to uh, overwork that comes with more digital remote flexible work styles and um, which is a supporting flexible and remote modes of work possess the risk of increasing social isolation and mental health problems among the young generation. Um, Rita, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I was reaching for the microphone. <laughs> um, see, I'm, I'm in support of remote work and flexibility that it offers, but at the same time, we see this trend of organizations fully moving to remote work, and I don't think it's very healthy, especially, again, for young people and their mental health. I think there should be a balance found between, you know, office work and in-person work, wherever it might be, and a flexibility that comes with a possibility to do remote work. So find a balance of you know ensuring 50-50 that you can come and work in person, can meet people, especially young people who just entered the workforce. They should be able to get mentorship in person. They should be able to acquire skills from people who you know have more years of experience than them. And I think it happens more easily in person. Um, so I do say I do think that organizations should be um, you know supported if they do still want to continue working in person. And I think right now is also a great time when we can start doing and start meeting in person again, like we are here as well. Um, at the same time, of course, there are still people and a lot of young people who will choose to travel. They will choose to work remotely um, and their mental health uh, is most probably going to be impacted. Um, so again, I think it's an important dialogue to have with employers. Um, there should be some checks and balances in place to see what employers are doing, what organizations are doing um, to foster these discussions. Um, you know, there are ways you can do it. You can do trainings. You can, you know, um, offer them psychological help and, and also pay for it. Um, and, and you can you know, sort of supported in many different ways. Um, and again, it should be incentivized, it should be discussed, um, but I'm sort of in support of also continuing to meet in person. Uh, and I see a lot of benefits in that. Sharka. Uh, from the trade union point of view, uh, we find it extremely important. We come stressing it, uh, stressing it out. And we've been talking about it even before the pandemic to uh, not treat the alternative uh, flexible work styles as benefits. It is still work. Uh, our experience, especially with remote work, was that it was by the employees, it was more demanded than it actually existed before the COVID times. And the, um, the employers expected that if you do have the possibility of working from home, that you work on god awful hours and you work much more just because you were given some sort of benefit. During the COVID time, we had a chance to uh, work from home even more than we actually ever wanted. And, um, it should be, again, one of the lessons that we learned that it's not a benefit, that it's a flexible arrangement. So what we as trade unions, what we stress is even 
<clears throat> in the case of flexible working arrangements, you still have, you still have uh, work condition regulations, you have health and safety regulations, and you have working time regulations, and they should all be uh, regarded with the, same, uh, with the same respect as when you're actually working in so-called standard, uh, standard working arrangements. Thank you very much. Um, we have one question here, which is about platform platform work, which I think is uh, the question for Iran. Um, uh, what legislative measures should be taken to eliminate the precarious uh, conditions of platform work? What aspects need to be uh, addressed in this in that regard? Thank you. Well, in my uh, introduction, I mentioned a few um, uh, gendered uh, negative effects of platform work as uh, could be the de-skilling or, um, or could be uh, the, the um, uh, problems that uh, we see in work-life balance. And uh, so to, to go a bit more in, uh, in depth on this, um, on these aspects, I think that uh, policies should uh, include uh, um, uh, this uh, gender dimension. So uh, we, we need to, to be conscious that uh, flexibility is good, but how women and men use that flexibility? This is a key um, uh, uh, question. Um, also, uh, another important um, area is segregation. You already mentioned it, right? Uh, these policies need to tackle segregation both in education and in the labor market because we see that the new forms of employment are mainly focused on male-dominated sectors. So we need uh, women to be there and we need to combat uh, the segregation in education, primarily. Uh, another uh, possible action could be to upskill uh, works that are uh, usually done by women. And, um, and as, a, as a third action, I could uh, mention uh, the support for workers that uh, are out of uh, the labor market because of uh, uh, digitalization. So we need measures also to, to support these workers and to uh, reorient them. Okay, Rita. Yes, can I maybe add, um, I think it comes, like it's connected to platform work, but also more broadly like freelance work and the flexibility that's offered is issues surrounding taxes I think these are not discussed often enough um, because, for example, within the EU, you can work from a different country for up to eight, um, 180 days, which is essentially six months. And if you do want to stay longer somewhere else, like there's no way or you need to register as self-employed in a different country. And oftentimes I feel like people who do freelance work and also who do platform work, they don't necessarily pay all the taxes they could be paying, uh, which then does not ensure that they have the social security. And also the gendered aspect of this would be maternity leave, for example, is not paid. Um, so I think legislation-wise, this is something that you should be also thinking about a lot on how to improve this aspect, especially also when people, so even if you can work from a different country within the EU for six months, if you want to move outside of the EU, that's even more complicated. And there are like double tax treaties between various countries, but they're very like specific and with particular countries. So the whole traveling aspect and the whole freedom of working from anywhere you want cannot necessarily be executed uh, by many individuals who want to do it. Or if it is executed, then they don't have the social security nets, which again, impact the gender aspect as well. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there is one more question, which I think is, uh, again, perhaps for uh, Mrs. Maxwell and Mr. Kim. In many countries, young women are more educated than men. How to transform it to equal labor market or political participation? And I would like to attach one more question to this uh, particular question is, okay, we're talking about uh, gender equality, um, but what is in there for men? <laughs> so, um, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Maxova. It's a good question, what about men? Because uh, I need that we need uh, 
uh, take more men to this discussion because it is not only uh, about women it is only uh, it is about men and about uh, our life as I can uh, feel um, a situation in European Parliament here is a gender question very important and I can say that a lot of men is including in this question, in this discussion, sometimes they are also initiator of uh, more, uh, many, many events. And, and uh, I can feel that uh, in European Parliament, uh, we have uh, uh, big support uh, of, of men to discuss and to go forward, uh, uh, to go ahead in this, in this question. Uh, it's difficult to say how to uh, recover to labor market because uh, we need to um, to um, mm, we need to destroy um, stereotypes in our society. I can feel it, and also is question about quotas. Sometimes. Uh, it can help, sometimes it is uh, really bad and we need to go very uh, slowly and very uh, uh, sensitive to go uh, ahead. But I know that in Czech, in Czech Republic we have also more um, university education women than that men. But in labor market, it is opposite. Uh, I think I, I will again repeat uh, my thought that it is education, uh, not only in school, but also in our family, in personal life. And we should be an example for our children that it was normal 50, 40 years ago now it is different. We have the same choice. We can choose what we can do. And we need to speak and speak and speak and educate our children. I know that it uh, takes time, but without us, it is not possible in the future. Mr. Kim, uh, thank you, Ms. Maxwell. Mr. Kim, um, in many countries, young women are more educated than men. We uh, heard that uh, in Czechia, the, the case is also that. How to transform it into equality in a labor market and uh, politics? And also, what is in there for men regarding gender equality? Um, yes, so thank you very much uh, for the question and the opportunity. I think at first it's important to emphasize that uh, you know, these labor market outcomes are not uh, zero-sum games. And so just because, you know, uh, let's say a young woman or a woman has taken up a job, it, it's not at the, not at, you know, necessarily at the expense of, uh, you know, of others. And so I think the, 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 the idea is to really grow the pie. And I think we've seen, for example, um, there's a lot of uh, literature out there that, you know, talks Talks about the harmful or the detriments of inequality, whether that's you know uh, between generations, but also with, you know within gender, that inequality is, is not good for growth and as such. And so, uh, addressing that uh, you know will can improve economic activity, which in turn can improve opportunities for uh, for everyone. So, in terms of uh, in terms of some of the policy responses required, I think uh, panelists as well have really you know identified many. Uh, and since I have uh, the opportunity, let me just I think highlight uh, two two areas. Let's say that where I think uh, perhaps more uh, you know effort is required. The first I think is really in terms of arbitration. So we've seen, for example, you know for for example in the UK that uh, workers you know. Uh, Uber drivers, you know, they didn't, they, they, uh, they argued that they were not, you know, independent contractors and took this to the UK Supreme Court, which subsequently ruled, you know, in their favor, actually. But I do see uh, these kind of tensions arising, whether it's in terms of you know, uh, in, in the crowd work, in terms of, you know, broad additional content. And so I think really um, there is a need uh, to strengthen labor market institutions gen all over, um, including, um, you know, including, for example, an arbitration mechanism, which I think are going to be pressured 
a lot more in the coming years as we see a lot more, uh, you know, uh, as, as we see countries, uh, you know, trying to better define the employment relationship. The second issue, of course, is that, and I think it's also, you know, widely spoken, but also I think it's important to uh, let me, um, and I think, and what, and the panelists has in fact said it, but we, we do need more young women's voices in, for example, in policymaking or uh, uh, in policymaking as well as in, in trade unions. And so how to support, you know, a greater number of women, uh, it, it, and especially young women, be part of uh, trade unions, be part of the policymaking process. I think those are those are some two areas I would like to just highlight at this stage. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as for our next questions, uh, there's probably a clash. Did I hear a difference of view between ILO and trade unions on digital transformation and what it means for gender equality? Sharka. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a difference of view, uh, but uh, let me say that trade unions might be slightly less optimistic. Yeah, um, as in not relying on the digital transformation itself to promote the gender equality or any other equality or improvement of workers' rights or workers' position. Uh, we have heard. Uh, today and obviously in, in previous discussions, uh, many risks that already seem to be uh, seem to be uh, proving themselves as in going into existence, such as um, gender stereotypes, including uh, being themselves included into uh, algorithmic management, for example, or algorithmic hiring. Um, the non-regulated flexibility being uh, actually a trap to some people who can't uh, use it uh, advantageously, for example, to work-life balance, but other than that, they have to take the most awkward times because they have no other chance how to find work or, uh, <clears throat> elsewhere. So uh, the digital transformation itself is a tool, is not an end, it's just a mean. And uh, if we want it to um, promote or con uh, contribute to higher gender equality or um, any other advancement of marginalized groups, uh, we can't just uh, roam it uh, freely and we should uh, consider some sort of sensible and effective regulation that would uh, limit the risks that already seem to be known. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. K, would you like to react? Oh, yeah, so thank you again. I actually, the, the mic was not working. Uh, I mean, I, could, I was not able to, to hear when Sarka or uh, other panelists were speaking. So I'm not quite sure exactly any um, where, I'm not quite sure what the, conf, if any, would be. And so I'm not really in a position to be able to, uh, to address that, uh, you know, prop. but let me just say that I think um, that's, that um, we know, for example, that there's severe, you know, underrepresentation of women uh, in the most disruptive technologies. So, for example, I think it was a WEF that came out, you know, that had some research that showed, for example, in cloud computing, uh, women only accounted for about, you know, 14, if I remember, about 14 or 18 percent of cloud computing jobs globally. And this is, you know, one of these front, technologically frontier areas, and so, um, and so, of course, there's many. Uh, some, well, I, I'm not quite sure where I, you know what the con what the conflict may be, but I think from our research, it, we it does indicate that first that you know that uh, that shorter like moving to digital, you know, uh, let's say remote work can maintain. Like, levels of productivity or even improve it slightly. So I think there is strong case for remote work, but I think, you know, as, as I think many panelists have mentioned, this is no panacea. There's many challenges associated with that, including, you know, uh, the fact that although, you know, uh, for example, that, you know, at some of the, you know, leading technologies, and these are, um, you know, technologies that will drive the future that women are severely underrepresented. So there's a number of challenges, of course, but I do think that there's quite a, quite a we do see quite a bit of potential in, in this employment being more inclusive of young people as well as of, 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 of women. Thank you. I think Sharka just said that the, perhaps the trade unions were less optimistic uh, in their views. Um, would you like to add more? Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's working now? It's not? Um, 
Yeah. Uh, despite that, Mr. Kim didn't hear what I, what I said. He uh, proved that there is not really a, a conflict of opinions between us, uh, between our, our uh, institutions. Um, yeah, uh, I would agree to what he said, that uh, it's not a panacea and it needs to be uh, managed to serve the ends we, we, we would like to meet. Um, I think uh, uh, we have one more space for the last question, if there is uh, a question from the audience right here. Um, if not, then I think our panel is coming to a close and um, there are some closing remarks that I would like to make. There's an EU research that proves that uh, gender equality and equality in general increases uh, GDP, which means equality is uh, also beneficial for economic growth. Um, there's also research saying that men who stayed at home uh, at least for a bit on parental leave with their kids, nine years later have um, a better and bigger relationship with their children. Um, imagine uh, living in a free society where you don't have to think uh, if your parents or your surroundings uh, would be concerned if uh, you as a man would like to become a nurse a teacher or anything else that uh, usually um, if the position is usually occupied by women uh, which uh, leads me to a point that equal society uh, also leads to um, more freedom thank you very much for taking part in today's panel uh, thank you to all the speakers. I think uh, great discussion and very thought provoking. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I would like to wrap up uh, this panel. And outside, there's a coffee break and networking opportunity waiting for you. For those of us, those of you following us online, we will be back after coffee break at quarter past 11. That's 11.15. But before you go, uh, I have a very important information regarding the seminars, because there will be happening three parallel seminars after the coffee break. The first one, actually the only one which will be simultaneously translated into Czech, uh, is on economic situation of young people in a context of inflation and employment, precarious working conditions and unavailability of housing. This one will be held in room club B. Uh, the second one on position of persons facing multiple disadvantages will be held in room club C. And the third one on role of education systems, competencies for the 21st century in the gender perspective will be held in room club D. Uh, Again, the only the first one in a room club B on economic situation young people will be uh, simultaneously translated into Czech. So you are welcome to choose any of those uh, regarding your professional and personal interests. And please, after the seminars, there will be lunch, which everybody is looking for, including me. And it will happen at 12.30 and will last until 13.30. So see you back at 13.30 and enjoy your seminars. Thank you. Great news. Thank you, Andre. <laughs>
Okay, I hope your bellies are full with the great food we had and uh, your minds are full with all the networking you, I'm sure, uh, went through and did. And uh, we are back now for the last part of our today's program. Uh, and we, with this panel, we will be finishing our two days that have been full of inspiring, innovative, sustainable, and inclusive ideas about the future of Europe. In this panel, we will offer you discussion of youth ambassadors with business representatives about values of diversity and inclusion in workplaces of the 21st century. From a young person's perspective, including those from outside of the EU, diversity should not be viewed as being limited to gender equality, but as a concept, and I think we've seen these in the seminars from different points of view, a concept that is encompassing a whole, <laughs> a whole range of life experiences and human differences. The above mentioned values are thus a link not only between stakeholders and states within, but also outside of the EU. This panel will be moderated by Jana Soukupová from Youth Speak Up, and she will be joined by Ms. Clara Escobar, Human Resources Director from Moneta Money Bank, Mr. Alexander Karatosho, European Democracy Youth Network, and Ms. Mariela Pag. Pagliuca, I'm sorry if I'm mispronounced, uh, from a Department of Equal Opportunities out of Italy. So without further ado, Jana, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for joining our forces today. Um, so today's name of the panel is the young generation diversity inclusion and businesses and i would open this panel with a sentence that young people are the leaders of tomorrow this weekend i read a very interesting article mapping activities and topics of youth organizations of the parliamentary political parties uh, and uh, they were mapping what they do and what topics they're interested in. And uh, gender equality and the equality of opportunities was a total must among their topics. So, especially here in the Czech Republic, we can see a significant difference between the youth political representation and slightly more senior political representation. However, it gives us the hope, the hope that this new representation will cooperate more closely with businesses and other stakeholders to build together an equal society. That's how I would uh, open this panel and uh, I would uh, uh, ask our uh, very amazing speakers to contribute to this debate with their 10 minutes uh, opening speeches. And uh, we can start with uh, uh, Mrs. Escobar, uh, who will tell us uh, about the company strategy in relationship to the topic. And also, we would love to hear, how do you attract the young generation in your company? Thank you. Thank you. Is it okay? Can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for invitation to this panel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and represent uh, Moneta Money Bank uh, and our strategy about diversity and inclusion uh, as an incremental part of our business strategy. Uh, so, uh, let me uh, start with, the, with our journey, uh, of our sustainable journey. If we can move to the slide number two. Uh, I would, uh, uh, okay, uh, so uh, what I would love to, love to, uh, to show you how we, oh, thanks. Um, don't worry, we will not go through all the details. Uh, just a few, few important uh, um, 
events that happened uh, in our uh, uh, really uh, short history. Uh, in 2016, uh, for those that you don't know, uh, our bank became um, um, through IPO, publicly traded bank, and it started uh, our, uh, let's say, a new journey uh, from 2016, and not only as a business, but also our um, strategy to sustainability. And uh, I would uh, jump to 2019, uh, where as a bank, we became uh, the first and the only company in Czech Republic uh, uh, listed in the uh, prestigious index Bloomberg Gender Equality, uh, where we are for the third year. And uh, our, our index, our um, ratio uh, is improving, which means that we are, we are doing good stuff and we are improving uh, diversity and inclusion agenda. Uh, also, the next year, 2020, was really uh, crucial for us. We established an um, uh, advisory body that uh, I will, I will uh, speak later on um, in more details, so-called Monifair. Uh, the name is My Fairness. So Monfair, the Moneta, so we can play with the name uh, and it, this name uh, as an advisory body for diversity and inclusion, the name came from uh, our employees because they uh, proposed this name uh, to, to, to impose the fairness across the company. Then we, of course, uh, published uh, our diversity and uh, inclusion policy in this, uh, this, that year. Last year, we created first uh, ESG strategy, where we uh, defined 11 sustainable goals. Uh, we received uh, some awards, I will not uh, go into the details, but uh, what is important that uh, to link ESG to uh, to KPIs of the top management means that they are clearly linked to their remuneration. So they are incentivized uh, to, to, to drive the agenda of ESG. This year, the last thing that we did was we, uh, we signed uh, and we publicly declared uh, that we stand for uh, women empowerment principles. Uh, three of the 11 goals that we have in ESG are connected with the diversity and inclusion, uh, with, the, with the letter S, as you probably uh, all know. Uh, so this is sh uh, share uh, of women in our management. We, wanted to in we want to increase our share from 42% to 50 in 2026, which means to be absolutely equal. Uh, and we are in a good path to, to achieve that. Uh, our gender pay gap, uh, also you can see, is decreasing. However, in 2026, we want to be absolutely uh, equal in the pay, uh, pay policy, uh, to pay equally men and women. And the third one is uh, the share of disabled employees, because uh, not only gender diversity is part of our policy, so also uh, that, uh, disabled, disabled employees, we, uh, they're, we are struggling. I will not um, be saying that everything is positive, everything is nice. That one uh, is hard to, uh, hard to achieve, but we are trying and we will, I'm sure that we will deliver those numbers. Uh, because in that, it's not uh, easy to, uh, just to, just to say we have the KPIs, we have the goals, but we need to have practical uh, activities behind that. So we defined five pillars uh, to achieve this strategic goals. We are supporting uh, parents uh, in Moneta, uh, and we, uh, I will show you the way how we do that. Do that. Then we are um, cooperating with the non-financial, sorry, non-profit organizations uh, into uh, hiring more uh, disabled uh, candidates. Regarding the gender diversity, uh, we uh, decided that we will go uh, into the uh, development and uh, um, and. Um, learning uh, path of our women, and we are increasing uh, this percentage via uh, learning and development activities. The third, fourth pillar is Mon Pride, where we support our LGBTQ plus uh, uh, group uh, among our employees. And the last one uh, is actually uh, the, la the newest, the youngest pillar uh, is called Mon Care, and there we are focusing on uh, supporting uh, caregivers as well as young. Uh, young employees, young, uh, young youngsters among our employees. Uh, so we, we have there this intergenerational dialogue. Quickly, uh, I will go to the, uh, what does it mean uh, to have this uh, employee platform, uh, so-called Monfair? Uh, you can see that we have our goal, we have our mission, and this, this, uh, this platform serves as a, uh, uh, as a dialogue 
uh, between the man top management, supervisory board, and employees. Uh, we are uh, also uh, we reassigned or re resigned uh, diversity charter. Uh, as I mentioned, we are part of uh, Bloomberg uh, uh, Equality Index for the third year. This year, we we we, we hope that we will be four time there. And also, we are uh, we publicly signed and uh, stand behind the uh, uh, Pride Business Forum uh, as one of the um, I think four banks in uh, on the Czech market. And uh, on the on the other part of the slide, you can see that we are we are we, what we do. We do really things that are practical for our employees, not only words but but actions. So when I said support parents, we provide them a subsidy to help them to return uh, earlier back to the work uh, after maternity and parental leaves. Uh, as, I'm, um, as, as I mentioned, uh, Activity Monster, we cooperate with, uh, uh, with uh, Atencel, uh, this is a non-profit organization, to really help us to focus on the uh, disabled employees. Uh, development program for women, we have their uh, increasing uh, interesting number. It's 159 women across our uh, company that participate the second year uh, in this development program. And uh, uh, in Mon Pride, what we did, we equalized benefits for our employees that are uh, in, uh, from LGBTQ plus uh, families that are uh, going, uh, that we equalized marriage and register partnership, simply said. And the last one, uh, as I said, uh, this is where we focused on uh, caregivers uh, among our employees, as well as uh, young employees under uh, umbrella Mononet, which is uh, our trainee program. Uh, and there we, uh, we announced or we introduced that program actually this year uh, we have um, almost 30 participants from students uh, the feedback is really is really positive because they created the program it wasn't that uh, we sat in the, in the in the meeting room and we said we will create something that we think will make sense but we invited our uh, our students uh, and they created the program for themselves themselves that's why they uh, they like it and if I'm correct, that's, uh, that's 10 minutes that I had for, for the presentation of our DNI strategy. And I would like to say that this is all, all the activities are really supported by the top management. So it's really business strategy uh, linked to, to, uh, to our DNI. And it's not the only HR activity. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Clara, for a very inspiring contribution. Uh, and uh, now, Alexander, uh, we would love to hear very much about your network, European Democratic Youth Network, um, and also what experience of Western Balkan countries uh, uh, is uh, when we're talking about uh, our topic of gender equality, and also what young people uh, in the EU uh, candidate countries address. Thank you. Thank you, Jana. <clears throat> so, the European Democracy Youth Network, as the name implies, is a network of young active citizens, individuals, that come from various backgrounds, share different ideologies, but strive for the same goal, uh, keeping democracy alive and the freedom of the individual. Uh, basically, we have 400, more than 430 members now uh, that are in 23 countries. Uh, countries that all share a uh, same similar totalitarian background, so basically the former Soviet countries and Yugoslavia and Albania. Uh, and our most important focus is decreasing the polarization in our communities because probably you have it here as well in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, we have a very strong polarization between different parties and uh, when they come in government, they're promoting their own ideas and their own people and in a way stigmatizing the rest. So the main goal of Eden is decreasing the polarization, but also we are working on, on promoting active citizenship and participation in the decision-making processes, which is why uh, we became one of the two NGOs that work with the European Commission on preparing uh, recommendations that uh, are 
that are that will be part of the future uh, uh, policy making and uh, we are working together with institutions with governments to in a way address this issue because we can see that the young people are are apathetic and are not that uh, much taking taking participation they're not taking part in the decision making processes so we are we want to change that as well um, when it comes to diversity, it is in the very core in, of Eden because our national chapters, the members in it, are from a diverse background. For example, when I talk about the Macedonian chapter where I come from, there are people that are part of the civil society, as me, and uh, one more member from the ambassadors, and the four other ambassadors are part of different political parties. One of them is advisory of the prime minister for youth and sport. The other one is uh, vice president of the youth wing in his party. The third one is a member of parliament so basically we are all in different sectors in different institutions and we're all working uh, on different stuff but for the same goal uh, and also when we talk about the more important bodies in the network the leadership council basically there are people from from uh, different countries and every country can have at the maximum of one part one participant in the leadership council in order to have equal representation of the regions that are represented in the network um, well, when we talk about uh, the work we do, actual work we do, the focus is on personal connection, building a network, a connection between the members in order to strengthen their relationships and in a way uh, develop future partnerships because they're the future uh, politicians, they're the future mayors and members of parliament. So in a way, by developing personal connections, they will be better at working with uh, with with uh, other other parties, other people that have different different ideologies, and uh, that's why we are uh, an example of a functional network, even though we come from different spectrums. Uh, when we come to the the European values and the Western Balkans that are uh, outside of the European Union, uh, there was one uh, interesting quote that uh, one colleague said on a forum previously. Uh, he said the Balkans are a family, but a very dysfunctional one. So the thing is that we are very similar. We have a very similar culture because when we say we have a different culture, it's not really true. I mean, US has a different culture. There are uh, African-Americans, there are Mexicans, Latinos, there are different kind of cultures and races and religions, but actually the Balkans is pretty much similar because we have a very similar past history. So basically we are very similar, but we have some, our internal divisions in our head that we should change them. Um, when it comes to this, the totalitarian histories that I mentioned, the recent ones, because we uh, had them until the 90s, um, in a way shaped us negatively because there is, was a lot of nepotism, there was a lot of corruption, and there wasn't any free speech. So basically now uh, I see the optimistic, uh, I'm optimistic about it because young people are changing this, they're traveling abroad, they're meeting different cultures and systems, and they see that this one promoting uh, free speech, democracy, is the best one actually, because we can all take part and we can all contribute to the system as a whole. Um, this also can, can be improved by the EU enlargement of the countries, because most of the countries in the Western Balkans already started negotiations process with uh, the accession process with the European Union. So this is also a place where the European Union can directly contribute to the democratization and transformation of the, of the Western Balkan countries. And um, we see different developments in each of the countries in the Western Balkans. For example, I will give the Europride uh, event that should have happened in Belgrade and the government in a way suppressed it because they want, didn't allow the people to march and promote their, their, um, their, let's say, different opinions. It doesn't matter which one it is, this is just an example. And the government in a way suppressed the LGBT community in, in uh, Serbia and didn't want for the march to go on because it was promoted as the biggest march in Europe that should happen. And in a way, Serbia and the Western Balkans in a way are very traditional in the mentality. So there were a lot of, uh, a lot of issues with the government, with the organization of the event, but in the end it went on. So it happened. And there were a lot of cases where there were reports of injuries towards some of the protests, some of the members that went on the Europe, uh, Europe Right event. And uh, this is issues that we work on daily. 
Uh, as a positive example, I would mention the Macedonian community, which is, uh, let's say, ethnically diverse, which has different religions, and it has been for a long time. But we had our issues in the 90s when we broke up from Yugoslavia, and uh, the, the situation was not that good. But now, in the last two decades, we were working actively on promoting minority rights, and especially uh, gender equality. Because now, as, as we discussed previously, for example, there is a quote, quotas in the Macedonian parliament where 40% should be women. And uh, in the last parliamentary elections, we already achieved that. So we have 42 or 44 percent women, which is something that, uh, let's say, we are proud of, even though the, the mentality of the people should be the further really changed. Um, about the youth needs, uh, about the last question, uh, Eden actually did a research together with the strategic analysis think tank from Slovakia, um, and they went to every capital in the Western Balkans and discussed with youth leaders, about with young people, uh, about the issues that they have on local level, national level, the relations between the, the, our, their country and the EU, and also what EU can do to, to their country, how they can help them, in which way, and in what uh, sector. Um, I was actually part of the, of the focus group in Skopje and we had a very fruitful discussion because we came also from different backgrounds, but we, in a way, had very similar opinions because the issues that we have on the whole Balkans are pretty much the same. Corruption, nepotism and, and issues that are at the very core of, of every state. Um, so now the publication will be the, published this month, but I would like to share a few key points before, before that, that, we, that all of the states agreed on, all of the young people agreed on. And the first one is that the EU is losing momentum. So basically this is not a new topic uh, in the Western Balkans. This is not a new topic because we had some uh, issues before and a lot of promises from the European Union. But the young people were uh, thinking that the EU is losing momentum right now because uh, we have also an active war on our continent, on our doorstep, and uh, there is a general decline in the popularity, in the approval for the European Union in our countries. For example, Serbia is, uh, the, the surveys say that uh, even less than 50% approve the EU membership currently. Uh, for Macedonia, it's pretty much the same. Now with the, the resolution with the Bulgarian dispute, we can see that um, also the, the, the popularity has decreased and there are a lot of all, all, above 50%, but it's the lowest in our history. So, so basically, this should be taken much more seriously now with all of the geopolitical uh, uh, situation that is happening. And um, the young people were thinking that the EU is losing credibility because it's, uh, it had a long-lasting promises that they give. For example, the visa liberalization for Kosovo, which is something that spreads over the years. There was also the accession negotiation, the start of accession negotiations with Albania and uh, Macedonia. But uh, it just happened recently, so we have some movement in that regard. We have uh, started negotiations. Uh, but we are still in a standpoint. So the young people were, were thinking that the, this led to a rise of populists, which is bad in the long term, and also that creates spaces for third actors to enter and in a way abuse this situation in order to keep the status quo and keep the chaos in the Balkans instead of us moving forward. So. Basically, the second point, which is brain drain as a strategic threat, uh, because brain drain is a very big issue that we have on the Balkans and we need uh, young people to stay and work in the country instead of live in the EU. So as a solution, there are a lot of programs that the EU can do in the Balkans and uh, it will be available much more in the, in the publication so you can read about it there. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, and uh, we can also discuss maybe about it uh, a bit in, in the uh, debate later. And uh, I would like to welcome also our online participants. Uh, 
And uh, uh, let's start with uh, Mrs. Luisa Wutz, uh, who is uh, representing today the industrial and engineering company with roots in Sweden, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, uh, I would like to, and we would like to uh, hear very much about your company's strategy in relation uh, to the topic of diversity and inclusion, and also how do you motivate the young generation to uh, join your company? Hi, everybody. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be here with you this afternoon. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your event today. Um, just bear with me a second. I've had so many technical problems today. It's typical, isn't it? Um, let me just share my slides with you. Okay, can you see, see my screen okay? Is it coming up yet? Not yet. Yes, now we do, thank you. Excellent. So as you can see here, I'm, I'm the Global Diversity and Inclusion Manager um, at Atlas Co, Co Group. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Atlas Co, Co Group, I think there is a, a kind of comment that they're probably one of the most successful Swedish companies that people haven't heard of. Um, and my background actually before joining an engineering sector was in financial services. So, um, yeah, I hadn't heard of them until I joined and it's such a huge, huge company all over the world. So we are based in um, 70 countries um, in terms of our presence. Um, and we've got customer, customers in more than 180 um, countries. And as you can see, though, we're, we're based um, in Sweden. Uh, so what do actually Atlas Copco do? So they do actually, they're an engineering organisation and it's decentralised. Um, and therefore we have four different business areas that are responsible um, for engineering across um, food processing, manufacturing, gas, um, electronics, I mean, pretty much anything that you see out there, um, you know, we're involved in actually the engineering behind it. So it's a fascinating company to work for. From a diversity and inclusion perspective, my role is hugely interesting because it is truly global. Um, and today, obviously, we'll, well, there's a lot of focus on Europe, but, you know, each day um, I, I pick up the phone or I open emails and I've got questions from, you know, South Korea to Brazil um, to France, Italy, Spain. So it's, it's a really, really fascinating role. And the benefit of, of that global role, it really allows me to see some of the differences that we see from diversity and inclusion, particularly when it comes to young people, but also lots of the commonality um, as well. And I would say probably from my experience, it's this younger generation where there's far more commonality than there is with, with, with older generations. So as I said, we're decentralised. Um, so Atlas Co, Co is the, the overall group name of the organisation, but you can see here, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're made up of many, many um, well-known business-to-business brands. So we are a business-to-business -business company. In terms of our diversity and inclusion strategy, um, I think there's sort of two key influences, I would say, that drive our diversity and inclusion strategy in Atlas Copco. One is the fact that it's our sector. We're an engineering company. And as you would expect with engineering, it's had in, in the past and still challenges, particularly around recruiting more women and having more women in the workplace. So that, that's a big, big challenge for us. But the other part as well is working with this global versus local. And you have to have a, a good balance of both. We're a global organisation and there's certain elements of diversity and inclusion that we want to ensure that we're consistent around that across every single site and all of our customers worldwide. But we've got to approach that locally. And that's something that's really, really important with diversity and inclusion is that we take into account the local, societal, cultural, legal um, norms within the countries that we operate and we fully respect them. So our strategy revolves around one, being aware that we're in the engineering sector and balancing um, global and local 
um, to, to obviously make progress and to achieve what we want to do. So at a very high level, our strategy takes in these four key areas. As you would expect, we're looking to increase the number of women um, working across our business. Um, this is very, very typical within our sector and other sectors where, again, there um, historically has been um, lower numbers of women. It's also a challenge for us. Some people talk about this later on, but going forward, it's still going to be a challenge for us because we know that when we look at the engineering sector, that we can see that there's still low numbers of women, one, studying engineering in the first place, but even when they qualify and graduate in engineering, choosing no to actually follow a career within the engineering sector as well. So this sadly isn't going to be changing anytime soon. So it's a key, key focus for us. However, we do have three other um, clear goals around diversity and inclusion. One is that we don't just focus on gender diversity and that we really work hard to increase that visibility, awareness and inclusion for all types of diversity everywhere we're based. Inclusion, as we know, is so important. And actually, inclusion is probably, I would say, the key word that drives this younger generation. Um, it's something I, I might bring up later. But when you talk to certainly that Generation Z, those of, um, who are probably anything between 15 and 25 now, inclusion is the word that will resonate with them far more than the diversity piece. And then bias. Um, so many people who work in the diversity and inclusion space will talk about unconscious bias. Um, but for me, this is something I'm really passionate about, that it's not just a training course and understanding that you have an unconscious bias. It has to start like that in the first place, but then you've really got to action it. And it's about making sure that every employee understands the impact that bias can have. And that it's also woven into our people processes that we're constantly reviewing. Our recruitment process, our development processes, our promotion processes to really structure those processes to minimise bias that way as well. So you have to really integrate this whole concept of minimising bias right the way through the organisation and what we do. So they're, they're the kind of key principles around how we approach um, diversity and inclusion in, in the organisation. So as I said, we've got global and local. <clears throat> and then that's surrounded by a focus on gender, wider diversity, inclusion um, and unconscious bias. Then if we look to the younger generation and, and what we are doing um, to inspire that younger generation, for us it's, it's a key fundamental part of our business and it's fundamental to our sustainability and our business success. So we really need to inspire engineering and that, that's the way I kind of put it. We want to make sure that from children from as early as five years, right the way through to them leaving university, that they're inspired to go and work in engineering. And we also want that younger generation to be a diverse group of engineers for the future as well. So one, it's about getting them into engineering and being fascinated by it, but also them wanting um, and we wanted to make sure that that's a diverse group because in the past that wasn't the case. So there's three ways um, that I look at that because clearly you're not talking to a five-year-old about having a career in engineering. But between sort of that five to 12 years of age, you're inspiring them around how do things work? What's an engineer? What do engineers build? Um, now you're, you're, you know, your own kind of... Um, backgrounds might be different from me, but growing up in Scotland in the 1970s, no one ever spoke to me about that. Engineering just was one of these careers that nobody talked about. And I didn't know what engineers did. So I think it's really important that we've got to get in there in the education system really early on to inspire them. Then as we get to 12 to 15, and people are starting to make subject choices at this stage, it's around what different types of engineers are there what each one does, what's the engineering design process, what's problem solving around. So you're talking about and inspire them in engineering in a way that is relevant for that stage they are in their development and their curiosity. And then as we get to 16 and 21, it's around what are the engineering career path and what are the options for study. So from us, remember I was saying, one, we've got to really encourage 
um, the younger generation to get into engineering in the first place. So that's one way of looking at it. And then the other element I said was then we want that group to be diverse. So one of the things that we are doing to really make sure that that young generation coming into the organisation are diverse. So you can see here from this slide, a lot of the focus obviously is, is on gender. So across the globe, we do offer different scholarships to women to come and study um, in engineering. The picture at the top in the middle there is some of our, our, our young students in Egypt, um, and they are probably around about high school age. So we've been doing work with them, and it's very much work experience based. Um, and then right on the right hand side there is your sort of five to 12 years of age, where actually we have um, school children from primary school or elementary school, and they're coming in and obviously they're working with our colleagues to understand exactly what they do, what does an engineer make, what's the impact of it's, it's, um, you know, the, the product. So the top is kind of showing you from a gender diversity, kind of working our way through those different stages. And then the other piece as well, what they're very passionate around is around um, doing some focused outreach with obviously particular groups of diverse students. So we've recently been working in the UK with an organisation called 10,000 Black Interns and offering internships for young black students. So we're just about to, to kick off that piece of work just now. Um, and then we've been working very closely with our LGBT network as well, going to career spheres um, and making sure that diverse students, particularly at that 16 to 21, know about our brand, know about the career options um, and very much want to actually start their engineering career with us. So just a bit of a snapshot, hopefully I'll get a chance to tell you a little bit more about it. But these are the sorts of things um, that, that we are doing. And I think it's nice just to finish off the, the letter that you can see there in the middle um, is around, you know, somebody thanking our early career specialist around you know, having that opportunity to come into our work, talk to our engineers, see what they do, it's inspiring to them. And we've just got to make sure that we're working together with business, we're working together with schools and with education and other external partners to really do that kind of inspire into engineering. Thank you very much, Louisa, for your very um, beautiful contribution. And now, last but not least, buongiorno, signora Paliuca. Can you hear us? Buongiorno, yes, buongiorno. absolutely. Can you hear me? <laughs> uh, we would love to hear uh, about your gender equality certification system and uh, in general about activities you do in Italy. So please, floor is yours. Thank you, Jana, and good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really pleased today to represent the Italian Department for Equal Opportunity. Uh, we are now talking about uh, values of diversity and inclusion. We talk about age, diversity, cultural and ability diversity, but also gender diversity, which is the core, the specific object of the work of the uh, Italian Department for Equal Opportunity. So today I represent the public sector, but I would like to talk about some policies that can be very useful in order to push also a, a, a diversity and inclusion approach um, more uh, likely on, on gender side in private sector, so in companies. Uh, the pandemic has revealed the presence of a great variety of inequalities in Italy as in, in Europe and the measures built in order to fight to challenge all the, uh, the, the challenges that the pandemic has made for us uh, have at their core the idea of build on countries that are more inclusive and that can be more sustainable also in the, in the justice way, in, in, the, in the justice sense. Italy's National Recovery and Resilience Plan has outlined our country path toward a more sustainable and just development in response in, to the overwhelming challenges that the pandemic poses. 
The plan is divided into six missions. So we go from digitalization, innovation, and culture and tourism to green revolution and ecological transition, infrastructure for sustainable mobility, education and research, inclusion and cohesion, and health. However, all these missions, even if they are characterized by a heterogeneity for, of purposes, uh, also share three cross-cutting priorities the are youth, citizenship gaps and gender equality. So the focus on gender equality issue is articulated in a broad program that try to uh, encourage from one side women's participation in labor directly and indirectly and to correct all the asymmetries that hinder equal gen uh, gender opportunities from the school age. I wish to mention some examples. First, um, uh, regarding labor, the guarantee of equal opportunities between men and women in both labor market participation and career advancement. For example, also in public uh, administration uh, with a, um, a renewal of the recruitment mechanism. On the other side, investment in the broadband and fast connection that can support women's entrepreneurship on en the enhancement and modernization of tourism and cultural offering that are sectors that are uh, dominated by women. Concerning the education and research macro area, I want to mention also the nursery school plan, which aims to increase the availability of child, child care spaces and also the extension of full-time schooling. These are measures that can support female employment, so it, it, it is a way to support female empowerment. And in addition also, and this is related to all the action that we have seen before from my colleagues in the panel, also the support for investment in STEM skills for young female students, so in science, technologies, engineering and mathematics. From the health front, it is planned to strengthen proximity and home care support services in order to reduce also the burden of care uh, upon the women's shoulder. Uh, with a specific reference to the business world, the National Recovery and Resilience Plan devotes particular attention to investment to support uh, female entrepreneurship and to create, as Jana said, mentioned before, a national gender certification system. I wish to focus a specific emphasis on this certification system because it is currently the flagship policy supporting gender equality in our country. The certification is a measure owned by the, uh, equal, the Department for Equal Opportunities and, and aims to support and encourage companies to adopt appropriate policies in order to reduce gender gap in the most critical areas, so gender pay gap, opportunities for growth in the companies, uh, maternity protection and also work-life balance. At the core of the intention to design the certification system, there is the recognition that to achieve a real paradigm shift, in this case in the private sector, gender equality principle must be fully integrated into business objective. For this reason, organizations need to acquire tools to focus broader on gender equality and on female talent, and to set precise goals for each stage of work, measure progresses, and also have a, a standardized way to measure these progresses and also to certify the results that they, uh, they achieved. It is also um, the, the measure, the system, certification system is also complemented by uh, a reward mechanism for companies that comply with equality principle that are functional to strengthen this model that promotes gender equality and creates a more um, sustainable value for company. First, for example, um, we, can, we can refer to the social security contribution. So the Italian government um, uh, allocated 50 million euros for 2022 and 2023 in order to uh, create an exemption for company from social security contribution. On the other side, we have also amendments uh, uh, made in the, the procurement code where contracting authorities indicate in their calls for tender a higher score that is linked to the possession of gender equality. To ensure an overall measurement of the level of maturity of each organization, six areas of indicators have been identified and these areas 
are uh, directly linked to all the, the variables that can identify inclusive and gender responsive organization. For example, culture and strategy, governance, HR processes, opportunities for women growth and inclusion, gender pay gap and parental protection and work-life balance. Each area is marked by a percentage way that contributes to the measurement of organization level and progress over time. For each assessment area, specific KPIs have been identified, both qualitative and quantitative, in, order, in relation to the different areas, to which to measure the organization degree of maturity through annual monitoring and a verification every two years, to give also the evidence of the uh, progresses that have been achieved and understand if there is the, the need of a, a kind of remediation plan in order to um, try to, to reach the objective they, the company fixed. Certification today is a fully operational tool. After the publication of the UNI practice, that is, UNI is the, um, the, the standardized, uh, the Italian body for standardization, um, this practice defining um, the minimum parameters for the acquisition of gender equality certification for company, and it was adopted by uh, ministerial decree, so it became law with the adoption by decree, the system, anti, um, the system entered in fully operation with also the first certification bodies accredited by Accredia, which is the Italian accreditation body. Currently, we have 12 certified companies. So we started in July with the process of certification. Um, and mainly, they are medium and small enterprises. However, um, nowadays, we have uh, certification bodies have more than 50 contracts signed with companies and also nearly 200 quotation issues or issued or processed. Uh, in addition, we hope to reach um, nearly 10 um, certification body by the end of 2022. So in order to accelerate also all the processes of certification for companies. It is worth mentioning also that um, in relation to small and medium sized and micro enterprises, the Department for Equal Opportunities will help support them in the certification process, providing um, uh, in economic contribution. From one side, a maximum contribution of 2,500 euros to each company for technical assistance. And on the other side, a maximum contribution of 12,500 euros to each company to cover all the certifications costs. Without any doubt, um, certification is a, is a powerful tool, but it, uh, it is related on one side to the uh, National uh, Resilience and Recovery Plan, but on the other side also um, uh, to the National Strategy for Gender Equality that is fully operative in Italy since November 2021. It is the, the first uh, strategy that Italy made on gender equality on the, following the European strategy for gender equality. And it is a, a powerful tool in order to strengthen the adoption of a gender mainstream approach in our country. The strategy uh, set uh, a very challenging ultimate goal for, for Italy, that is to succeed in gaining five points in the European ranking in the, for, of the AG index. Um, the idea is to create and to build on um, a country where people of all gender, age and backgrounds have equal opportunities for development and growth, personal and professional. And on the other side, uh, they can, must have the same uh, chance, the same possibility to realize their potential and also to have the guarantee uh, uh, to, to, can, to reach all the objectives objectives that they, they want to, to reach. Uh, the points that I have just summarized well reflect the um, Italian government commitment to the promotion of gender equality and the full adoption of the mainstreaming approach in the last months, in the last years. And it is in line with the recognition that for a sustainable and just growth, um, we have to have a switch uh, on our mindset and our action based on diversity and inclusion.
Thank you so much for your attention. Grazie mille, uh, Maria. Mariella, sorry, Miss <laughs> uh, for your very interesting um, contribution and sharing the best practice of Italy in our uh, agenda. And uh, now we have approximately slightly more than 30 minutes for the discussion. And uh, I will dare to steal the first question, actually. Uh, uh, my organization, You Speak Up, is, uh, since 2018 has been trying to um, promote the youth participation in politics. And we are trying to get more uh, youth topics into the public political debate. And uh, we made a professional survey uh, monitoring the um, youth topics in the country. And uh, actually, the gender equality uh, 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 is one of the five top topics that came out of this survey. So there is like a, a data saying uh, young generation wants to deal with this topic. However, sometimes we feel that we are operating in the environment that is kind of deaf and mute when talking about this issue. Uh, and that's why I would like to ask uh, fellow participants uh, this uh, quite a difficult question maybe. How do you open the topic of gender equality uh, in the environment that is not directly set as the one that would deal with such agenda? Because like banking, industry, uh, Western Balkans, Italy, Czech Republic, those are not like automatically uh, countries or uh, environments that uh, uh, it would be the agenda number one topic. So please, if we can start with. Uh, yeah, you mentioned first uh, so, banking, so I will I will steal the steal the, the floor. Uh, well, banking is the is still the world of man. Uh, let's face it. Uh, however, uh, I have to say that. Um, Either uh, we have uh, really, um, uh, really like open, uh, uh, I would say, environment in our bank, uh, and we have it. Uh, that's why gender diversity is one of the uh, key uh, key topic in uh, in the agenda. You, you saw that uh, this was uh, basically one of the pillar of uh, diversity uh, and inclusion uh, strategy. And uh, what helps? It's to have really uh, the CEO that understand that this is really crucial. So it's really top-down uh, driven agenda. Uh, and also, uh, I have to say that we have we have uh, our shareholders that they are asking, "What are you doing in the agenda of diversity and inclusion?" Now, now uh, it come uh, it, it's the also enlarged with the whole uh, ESG. So uh, it's the external pressure. Uh, from the from the shareholders, and also uh, really um, the open mind uh, CEO uh, and also the the board, and uh, I have to say that we did also some of the actions that probably would in other bank not be possible. Uh, for example, we changed one of the third of supervisory board, uh, and uh, there is uh, one third is women. Uh, these are the representatives of employees. However, we have there three women out of nine. So so uh, some of the bold actions we did uh, in, 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 in course to, to achieve the plan that we have to have 50% of women in management. So uh, just to be bold, just to do the actions and, and have really support from the top. That's the plan. That's the idea. Thank you for your recommendation. And Alexander, what do you think? Well, I think, uh, I think I'm in the best position because civil society is a really example of how, of how diversity and gender equality should be achieved. Uh, in, in my community, probably in most of Europe, the, most of the participants in the civil society are women. Uh, there can be many reasons for that or explanations, but in the, the practice is that. So that's a very good field, how we can start working with each other. As I mentioned, we are a diverse group, so from many countries, uh, many genders, many, uh, many, many different stuff about us, but we are functioning perfectly. There are many international organizations that are a, a very good proof of that, that uh, combined synergy is something that we can, uh, that something that works and that we can use to, to improve our community. And um, I think that, that 
how to popularize the topic. I think that EU is doing a very good job at this with the different programs like Erasmus+, Plus, like uh, Horizon Europe, because it fosters cooperation between different stakeholders, uh, uh, consortia. Um, and I think actually these kind of programs are something that is very valuable and uh, there is, that's uh, good news that you increase the budget for Erasmus Plus and for Horizon in order to, to stimulate this, this uh, cooperation. But on the other hand, I believe to, uh, it's very hard to change the mentality of the people that are already past the educational level and are already brought up in a different system. But I believe that the main focus of uh, popularizing the topic is schools, because children don't have prejudice. Sc uh, children see themselves as equals and don't see she is a woman or he's a guy or he's a boy. So these are the. This is the. I think the main. Uh, uh, place that we should focus our education on and to, in a way, promote uh, gender equality there first in schools and then those generations to change the community afterwards. I think that the younger people have these different opinions, but we should put a bigger focus there in the, in the educational system. Thank you very much, Alexander. And now I would like to ask uh, Luisa the same question, I guess, that industry uh, and engineering, that's that's really a difficult environment for our agenda, but uh, you've made it. So uh, please, if you could share your experience. Mm. Um, so obviously, listening to, to Clara and Alexander, um, I very much echo um, both of what they've said, but sort of trying to kind of bring it together. So yeah, certainly, first of all, from an engineering sector, similar to what Clara's done in finance, gender diversity is by far our biggest issue. And it's the area that we get lots of focus on from our CEO and from our stakeholders. But it then for me now, I feel like over the last few years, it's really about getting a balance because we know that we can't just keep focusing on gender diversity because one, it starts to exclude some people. Um, and for some countries across the world where we work, um, diversity is still quite a new concept to them. And actually some people think diversity and inclusion is just gender diversity. And as Alexander said, we have this generation of, of, of children you know, going through our, our primary schools and into secondary schools, but actually diversity means lots of different things to them. So it's getting that balance of having a focus on gender diversity, but not to the detriment and not to exclude inclusion and other types of diversity as well. Now, that might sound easy to say, but when you're working as Clara and I in, you know, with shareholders and in our day-to-day -day in our organisations, people are very, very busy doing their jobs and they, they can get a bit like, well, one minute it's gender diversity, now you're saying it's this and then it's inclusion. For them, it seems to be all different separate things. Um, and for me, I think one of the key things that we're really trying to do in, in Atlas Copco is really drive this understanding of inclusion so that they just think about inclusion and it all kind of falls in, in line with them rather than seeing it as so many different separated segments that they need to, to focus on. So it's yeah, definitely a balance. Um, get gender along with the full broad spectrum of, of diversity and inclusion, but get a really good balance of it. And also take into account that the generation coming in to the workplace now is very different from the generation that are leading the workplace. And there's a really important balance there, which hopefully we can talk about later, is about how they talk to each other and how they appreciate those differences that they're experiencing because of their age. Luisa, thank you very much for your contribution. And Maria, yeah, Mariella, I'm sorry, Spanish, Italian is mixing in my head. Uh, but uh, uh, please, if you could share uh, your point of view on how to open uh, this uh, topic in a difficult environment. I guess Italy is not easy either. No, absolutely. Jana, you're right, because first of all, we have to remind that uh, sometimes all the challenges that are related to gender equality are cultural challenges in a certain way. So you have to, to have this um, step forward 
in order to uh, create an, uh, a favorable environment for cultural change, because you have to, um, to push, to modify the, the mentality, the idea that you have of family, of works, to uh, eradicate all these stereotypes and all the biases that we are get used to uh, in, thanks to our culture. So, um, absolutely, uh, the, role, the role of uh, public sector would be to, for example, also for, with the certification system, is to push uh, a kind of, of, of switch, uh, a, a, a change in the, in the mentality in the private sector, but that can also have a a kind of positive spillover in the society. So try, if, if we have more female CEOs, if we have a powerful women uh, inside the, 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 all the, uh, the, the, the wide range of industries, uh, we can try to, to move on on all the stereotypes and the, the segregation that we have created in the past. On the other side, also education is fundamental in order to eradicate all the stereotypes because school is a kind of second family. So if you work from the beginning of the school age, you can try to, uh, to create a real perception of equality between girls and boys. So absolutely, these are the, the two points in the two main challenges, I think, uh, in order to reach a, 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 a full gender equality. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now I uh, would uh, give uh, maybe space to our public that is that is here in our room. So, a question: If if anybody has a question, uh, now is the now now the floor can be yours. Uh, if not, we have many questions from. Um, from viewers, ah, I can see a uh, uh, hand there. So, if we can give that, uh, uh, yeah, thank lady a microphone. Hello. Hello. Um, you mentioned different things in your presentations, different examples of what organizations are doing to foster this inclusion and diversity. And I think there's, like for years, there have been talks that it should be fostered and we need to focus on it and open a dialogue. But perhaps you could maybe summarize briefly all of the participants, perhaps, what exactly your organizations are doing. Because one thing I'm struggling with is I see that a lot of organizations do things when, you know, there's the Pride Month happening or there's Equal Pay Day and they focus on these specific one-off kind of activities and then it ends so maybe if anybody has examples of like long-term involvement how to foster inclusion and diversity in organizations um yeah that would be good to hear thank you so you're asking all our participants right or okay okay so uh briefly maybe we can start if i may uh Probably I skipped the, the slide uh, too fast, but you could see that we started in 2015. Sorry, 16 was the IPO uh, when we uh, when we started the um, diversity and inclusion thinking what to do as a, as a, as a bank because we uh, for those that you don't know, but uh, our bank before it was GE Money Bank, and we became Moneta Money Bank, so it was absolutely new bank. Probably the premises were the same, but uh, the, the culture and processes were different. So we started uh, that time, and uh, what we have right now, we have long-term plan to uh, to achieve the, uh, the the this 11 sustainable goals are 2025, 2026. So it's not one-off, and we have clearly uh, defined a plan to achieve them let's say, the gender pay gap in 2026 to be zero. So we have to have every year, uh, not every year, every day, some actions to, uh, to improve it. So it's, it's really, we have, uh, it's probably uh, look like three uh, goals, but there are many activities behind to achieve that. And it's, uh, it's, really, uh, it's really for us long term. So just, just the example, gender pay gap, increasing the number of women in management means development every day uh, to, to, to prepare a new generation of women as their leaders, uh, training them, promote them. So we, we focus on, uh, on the numbers. We have the, uh, the numbers behind that. So that's, that's the second. And, and uh, for example, the last one is also how to re retain, which I didn't mention, but retain ma uh, 
employees coming back from paternity and maternity leaves. And we have there uh, so far 72% uh, retention rate. We want to improve to have at least 80, which means of, of, again, every day to work with those that are returning back because we focus on 12 months retention period. It's not that they are coming, but 12 months we have them. So that's, that's our clear examples that we do, not one of, but really long term steps. Thank you, Clara. Uh, who else wants to contribute? Yes, as you mentioned, there are, there are different organizations with different aims, uh, and that's true. But, for example, Pride Month, you mentioned, for example, that's more of a publicity thing to make it, uh, to make it uh, heard in the community, for people to talk about it. But there are a lot, most of the organizations that I work with in my, in my community, because I've been active in the civil society sector for the last 10 years, uh, most of the organizations that are working on these topics work uh, for the whole year, but it's not maybe that public. For example, you do Pride Month, you do this kind of focus groups, consultations, work with, uh, with the, your focus group, with the group that, is, uh, that you're concerned with. But then you should push for that in your local environment, in your national, uh, to your national government. So basically for the whole year, you're actively working on that. You're lobbying, pushing all the times, uh, talking what is done and what is not. And in a way, organizations, civil society organizations should be the watchdog of the government. They should seek uh, reforms and they should ask from them, what have you done? Because when elections come and they say, we've done this, 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 okay, what did you do about LGBT plus rights? Uh, what did you did about uh, environment and the climate change and uh, the pollution? Because also in the Western Balkans there's a lot of pollution and it's the same thing. The environmental protection is very popular when the winter comes and the city is very po polluted. But then in spring, summer, nobody talks about it. And that can be an issue, but uh, most of the organizations or the ones that are that are existed for a longer time are actively working on the issues for the whole year but main thing is uh, in a way working with the general population but also with the institutions to in a way do something that can change uh, change the situation uh, in practice thank you alexander uh, luisa uh, if you have um some contribution you can start and uh, Mariella you want to um, join this round as well right or no okay so Luisa uh, your turn please okay, it's and not then... my my key point okay. but so maybe Luisa and the others could have a, a more powerful uh, answer to the question than than mine because I I'm on the public side so maybe it could be a little bit different Thanks, Maria, and, and thank you to whoever asked that question. It's a good question and one we often get. Um, there's still a need for celebrating different events or raising awareness. Um, so first of all, I think we're hopefully all in agreement for that because all of us are on our own separate journey of awareness. Um, and one year by celebrating Disability Month or Black History Month or Pride, you're always going to engage somebody who wasn't engaged before. So that's it's a really, really powerful. Um, but as the, your colleague said, you, that's not what diversity and inclusion is about. And when I started working in diversity and inclusion about 10 years ago, yes, it was about doing events. And I think people thought that diversity and inclusion specialists just ran events around education. And it's so much more than that. And very much now you'll find diversity and inclusion specialists probably 90% of my job is around in trying to embed diversity and inclusion across all of the different functions and departments right across the business. So I spend time with all of my colleagues, helping them think about their day job, but with a diversity and inclusion lens to it. So I'm working with our learning and development colleagues. For example, they might be doing um, you know, leadership development, management training courses. It used to be in the day that you would have a separate topic on diversity and inclusion run by a diversity person. Very much so now I'm working with them on creating that content to make sure the content on any of the topics has inclusion and diversity woven into it. Um, the people who are responsible for our talent processes, Clara sort of touched on that. So again, working with my HR colleagues to say, okay, what is our recruitment strategy like? Who are you? Um, who's seeing our job adverts? How many women are applying? How are we tracking that data? 
Um, also looking at our promotion criteria, the promotion process, and working with the colleagues in HR who are responsible for that, for designing it in a really good way. Our communications colleagues, we've got communications colleagues all over the world, um, and in the past their focus might very much have been on um, marketing and selling our products to customers, which it clearly still is, but they have a huge role around educating both internally and externally around diversity and inclusion. For some of them that comes very naturally, for some of them it doesn't, and I spend a lot of time engaging with our comms and branding colleagues and giving them advice and guidance and looking for ideas about how we can share um, inclusion. Procurement teams, I work with our procurement teams as well. So yeah, I, we spend a lot of our time working our way around the business, really trying to make sure that diversity and inclusion, as you've said, is not one-off events. It's not about celebrations. It's about fundamentally trying to ensure that everything and everyone in the organisation has that approach and is thinking about it when they're doing their day-to-day -day job. So hopefully that's kind of brought it brought it to life for you a little bit around, you know, my kind of day-to-day -day job. Um, really interesting because you get to learn about the business a lot. Um, and it's wonderful just to see people's awareness and education constantly change and constantly evolve. Most people say, I never thought, you know, that I had a role to play in that and I didn't know what I could do. Um, so that's what we spend a lot of our time on and it's really important, that embedding piece. Lisa, thanks a lot. Welcome. And uh, uh, now we could maybe have a look on the Slido because we have some questions from uh, the people who joined us online. And uh, the most rated question is, what is the major difference between the priorities of young generation in the EU member states and candidate countries in connection to gender equality? So, Alexander, maybe do you want to start? Well, <laughs> the, the, the policies that we do actually are not that different from the EU because we want to become part of the EU and the politicians will promise everything to the to the European representatives when they come and, and visit us. Uh, but so the legislation is pretty much balanced. Uh, the practice is the issue, but as I mentioned, for example, the, the Parliament is a very good example of that. It was pushed by uh, by the European Union, but in practice, it really functions. There are 40 plus percent women in the Parliament. Uh, when it comes to the cabinets of the ministers, of the prime ministers, of the highest offices, the president, uh, we have a lower percent. It's like 30 to 20 to 30 percent. Women. So we have to work in that field. But um, from my personal view, the biggest uh, difference when it comes to, to the younger, I mean, to the gender uh, situation in the Balkans is the mentality of the people. Because, for example, we, we discussed that on the break. Um, a parent will leave his, uh, his her inheritance to the male child, not to the female which is illogical. I mean, they're both your children, but still they leave the inheritance to the male instead of the female, and the female should supposedly find someone and that will give her a house, a home, or whatever. So I think the mentality of the older generations is an issue. The younger ones are better, and the situation is improving, but still there are a lot of these traditional views that personally I wouldn't be able to understand, but there is a stigmatization towards the women in more personal way, in a more deep level. It's not, let's say, on a state level, because we have different issues. Our priorities are, for example, nepotism and corruption. And, uh, for example, there is a difference between the wife of the prime minister and some regular citizen's wife, because that she has more benefits or she gets employed. So basically, our fight is not that much on gender balance in the system as much as uh, bigger issues as, as rule of law or or corruption, but when it comes to gender equality, as yes, the mentality is, I think, the, the most crucial part that we should uh, work on. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else would like to contribute? Um, maybe uh, let's have a look. The second question, in what ways can the youth be engaged more in the decision-making process when most of the power positions are occupied by the elder generations? Maybe Mariella, would you like to would you like to contribute to this one? 
Uh, it's, it's always, I think, Jana, something related to the cultural approach and to the stereotypes, because we have also gender stereotypes, but on the other side also the conviction that maybe young people could not be able to, to make decision or to, to, to be at the top or in decision-making uh, positions in, for example, in uh, private companies, but also in the public dimension. So maybe uh, I think that um, there is, uh, from one side I can state that maybe today the young generation in Italy, I refer to, for example, gender equality, uh, has uh, built on a, a very, um, uh, a bigger awareness about their potential and about the possibilities. So uh, the struggle is try to, to convince maybe the, the, the older generation to give the, the chance, the possibility to the, the younger generation to try to have their place and try to, to make in, in the concrete uh, sense. So to try to, to be able, so we need to, to build on a cultural change even in this, in this sense, I think. Maybe I refer to the Italian uh, situation, uh, but it, it is a stereotype also uh, thinking about that, okay, if you are young, you are not able to do to make a decision on, on so on. So absolutely, this is the, the main point. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody would like to contribute to this one? Alexander, if you can briefly. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm striving for the same thing for years. And using the methods, for example, I suppose that in the Czech Republic is the same situation. There are local youth council, there are national youth councils that uh, actively work with the political elites, with the politicians that are in power. So using them as a method is a very crucial thing because they have direct contact to the politicians. But also the civil societies uh, can surely demand this from, from the, the people, people in power. I mean, People engaging in the civil society and grouping towards the same uh, goal is something that is very powerful and can be a change, uh, can bring to a change if it's done uh, properly. Thank you. And uh, I would maybe add one more thing, and that's a positive motivation by uh, example. Uh, and that's, that's the thing that uh, there should be some pioneers showing that uh, there is a way how to do this career and how to be kind of good guy in this world. Uh, but uh, I guess that such a positive examples are sometimes missing or turning wrong. So we still need to work on it and uh, motivate each other to keep uh, fighting in this quite uh, imbalanced uh, fight and uh, uh, kind of uh, strike together hopefully one day. <laughs> If I may add, uh, you mentioned positive examples. Uh, we we use these positive examples uh, in our company. Uh, we have um, really uh, talented uh, young managers uh, that they started as a as a trainee uh, in part. The, they were participants of the trainee program or internship uh, program, and uh, currently they are managing uh, quite big departments in risk management or also in the uh, in the sales division so we show that this is possible however uh it's very we we, we need to we, as you mentioned positive examples uh however there is something also some some cost there there is nothing that for free we need to have some kind of like uh, uh energy put to, to that to, to to work on uh, on uh own development and really on the expertise because it's just not by because I want to be manager, I want to be the uh, part of the decision process. So uh, it's really something that uh, uh, we need the investment from also the youngsters. <laughs> I mean, to themselves. Can I sign it? <laughs> um, and uh, now I would like to ask uh, again uh, our public that is present uh, in uh, the Congress Center here. Do you have some questions? I can't see any, so let's continue with the uh, uh, Slido. I can see quite a, a spicy question. <laughs> Part of the young generation tends to learn towards, uh, now help me, uh, misogyny. 
uh, and hate to uh, emancipate it uh, and hate emancipated women. How to best address that? So, who would like to start on this? Ignore them. <laughs> it's really, I think, that in this moment, uh, expl explaining and, and trying to persuade uh, would not work. I think that uh, we are, uh, if I'm correct, 21st century, and this kind of uh, tendency, it's, uh, it's really, it belongs to absolutely different century. So I hope that this is more like a joke, this kind of question. Anybody else? Yeah. Alexander, I would I would say that we should deal with an issue. I wouldn't agree to, to ignore them, because it's a serious issue and it can lead to some uh, very serious consequences. If we, as we know, because there was a sh public shooting, like in a school, as as I remember a few years back, uh, from the guy that they consider the the founder of the incel movement. And I would say that there should be a bigger focus on the male population about gender equality because uh, as we can see in the room now here, 70 plus percent are women. And I also, when I work on this issue, for example, because I'm also a young European ambassador from the Western Balkans, I had a workshop for the 8th of March about gender equality. And there were like 10, 12 participants and all of them were women. So it's, I mean, it's good to work with them as well, how to teach them in a way how to fight or promote their ideals and to promote this but still the main focus group for this issue is working with the, the male population definitely and uh, in a way to have the more rational men let's say than the more the people that don't have this kind of radical views uh, not pressure but in a way um, <laughs> make the others that have more radical views change their position because talking to them but through through these lectures or through this work as speakers it's not going to change but peer-to-peer -peer connection and working between themselves like making this kind of a uh, movement this kind of opinions uh, misogynistic opinions uh, let's say uh, negative and uh, some things that is stigmatized by everyone then they will probably not not be supporting it. Luisa or Mariella, uh, I cannot see you now, so I don't know if you're... Yeah, now I can see. So, uh, yeah, Mariella. Yeah, now just a few words, because absolutely uh, the gender equality means try to also raising the awareness of boys and the male population. Because, okay, it's okay to talk about gender equality with women, but on the other side, women's well known, all the prob problems and all the challenges that they have to face. So on the other side, it is important to share this kind of education and awareness with the, the male population. So, again, starting from the school age, first of all, and try to um, transmit the message that women and, and, and men, but boys and girls can have the same choices, the same chances to, to do everything, and they, there is no reason to consider uh, a girl um, weak, weaker than you, or, or maybe not able to do something. These are the roots of the, the, this kind of hate. And it could be also very harmful because of sometimes this kind of male hate uh, will, will reach will violence peak. So it's not, we have to work on the, from the childhood on this kind of point with awareness and, and education. Thank you very much. Luisa, is there something you would like to contribute to this one, or can we go to the next question? I've always got something to say, but I'm conscious of time, and I'm sure we want to get another another question in. So by all means, on you go. Okay, uh, so I think that there's time left for one more question. So if I, we can get back to Slido, because I saw a very interesting one. What can the public and private sectors do to support the uh, youth more to being politically active? So, any ideas? Clara? <laughs> Well, that's a tricky question because as a um, as a bank, as a um, 
representative of, uh, of uh, um, quite a big company, we try to be apolitical uh, because uh, that's something that, um, so for me, difficult to uh, answer. So, sorry. Um, for us, uh, you know, banking itself is quite hot topic, so <laughs> connected with the politics, it's, it's, it would be explosion. So. Um, so maybe Alexander. Well, I, I would add just shortly because I'm, I'm talking to most of the questions to leave space for the others. Uh, I would add critical thinking in education because that is lacking, at least in the Macedonian educational system, but probably most of the, the educational systems in, in the world, not in Europe. Uh, so I would add critical thinking because that is what is missing for people to judge the politicians to critically analyze what is needed and to, to do something. Because when you see, uh, when you critically look at a situation and know how to judge it, it's much easier to, to in a way, uh, get into politics. And uh, I, I'm also not very good, very loud advocate for civil education, but in a very deep sense, not to be something that you can go for one year and learn some theory theoretic stuff, but volunteer, contact your local uh, civil society organization, the school should work with their local civil society organization for children and young people to go to do some actions, to plant trees, clean something, like to be a mandatory activity where people will connect to the local community. Because when you connect to your community, then you'll have the willingness and the motivation to go to go run for, a, for a, an office and do something more as a... Uh, to be more political active. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Luisa or Mariela, would you like to contribute to this? I'm similar to Clara, and obviously in the private sector, we are apolitical as well. So that's it's not something I can really answer. Uh, so maybe we still have like one minute left, but. <laughs> Um, let's let's uh, choose it so maximum. Uh, but uh, okay, my question: Who should be the driver of the change? We're talking about gender equality. We have a public sector that is trying a bit slow. We have quite progressive some companies. Not every company is progressive. So, who should be the driver? I can, I can start with that one off if that's okay, um, and I'm sure we'll probably be in agreement with this. It's everybody. I think everyone has to take a responsibility for that, um, and in order to do that, we need to communicate with each other. And I think that's what really varies. I think depending on the country that you're based, the sector that you're in, the type of organisation that you are, sometimes communication channels are better than others. But absolutely, everyone has a part to play in doing that. Um, I, I, at my experience, it's just the communication and actually the networking and building those contacts. Once you do that, that really opens the doors. Clara? Absolutely agreed with Luisa. Uh, I think uh, as a private company, uh, we, what we are doing, the best practice sharing, networking, uh, that's that's a key because uh, some uh, some companies more advanced in that agenda, gender agenda, or in uh, other other topic of diversity. And I think uh, as a private sector, we can be the challenger of the of the of the politic uh, political parties or, or politicians and uh, and the state and and really speed up the processes and the changes. So I hope that. This, also this forum will help because some of the things uh, we do and we don't need to wait for um, gender pay gap directives etc because we just think that is correct and is right so I think that as, as Luisa said everybody thank you Alexander would you like to I, I completely agree with with my colleagues. I think she should be bottom up approach because all of us are responsible. And uh, as as Luisa mentioned, we should be in a community together because one person saying something, nobody will take him seriously. The government won't look at your Facebook post or what you shared. But if you gather in a community as civil society organization, fight for a certain cause, and if you get gain momentum, then a real change can be done because politicians want to get votes, and if they see this is popular they will advocate for it as well. 
Mariella, we have one last minute, so if you would like Diana, to... Diana, very shortly, I completely agree with all my colleagues, everybody, everybody in its own room. So I'm from the public sector, so I, have tr I try to, to promote gender equality from the professional side, but on the other side also in my private life. And I think that my colleagues are doing the same in their experiences. So in the private sector, with banking or in engineering and so on. So absolutely every step that we can take from professional, private, in families, in our relationship is a, a little step uh, that goes in, in, the, uh, in front of gender equality, but also in considering all the other diversity and inclusion issues. So it's the same for everything. Thank you very much. Isn't it beautiful to finish this panel debate with a unity? <laughs> so, uh, the time, uh, yeah, we don't have a space for another question. So, thank you very much, our amazing speakers, for this very uh, fruitful discussion. And uh, uh, thank you very much, everybody who was here today with us. Uh, thank you also our online uh, viewers who supported us with their questions. Uh, if you have any follow questions, I think LinkedIn works perfectly. So please don't hesitate to search us. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, thanks a lot. Have a great day. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will be talking for a few minutes, so feel free to remain seated or leave. That's up to you, really, because it's my dear pleasure to close uh, this day of the conference with some final remarks. Uh, during one of these seminars that took place before the lunch, somebody, uh, I think it was Jofia actually, uh, was talking about the need to refrain from using some buzzwords as a catch-all terms without concrete meaning. So I hope with these concrete remarks to sort of uh, wrap up, uh, wrap up uh, speech, uh, I will kind of ground some of them in reality. Uh, so what is apparent is that the future of work will not be automatically free from the gender inequality. But if tackled properly, we can all help to create many opportunities for workers to thrive and we should not sideline young people from these important discussions. For one, we have to be mindful of the double-edged nature of flexible working arrangements because they might allow for a better work-life balance but they also might uh, pose a threat of overwork or social isolation. What the, one of the topics that has been really like weaved through a lot of uh, a lot of the speeches today has been that a digitalization is not implicitly good solution without proper care, and care uh, aligns closely with intersection or intersectionality, another important topic that we've heard quite a lot today. Uh, meaning that gender, racial, economic, health and other inequalities are necessarily enmeshed in each other. So as per our panelists and seminarists, intersectionality is recognized in the EU policy, but not in legislation with the danger of becoming lost in translation. And I think this is uh, and it has like also during all the many discussions we had, this has uh, proved to be true. Uh, in regards to other concepts such as diversity and equality that might lose some of their meaning when we don't firmly uh, firmly define them in the proper contexts we need to we need to we need to start with theory but also put it in practice a topic across many talks today seems to be that, and this is my interpretation that inequality begets another inequality and uh, this only rings. This also rings true when it comes to education and access to basic tools. To uh, be it, we heard it in the first panel. Be it access to broadband internet, or be it access to healthcare or education. 
And it is with education that uh, where we can start dealing with some of those issues. Critical thinking, social, emo socially emotional thinking with focus on gender aspects can foster environment or improve in quality. The overall hopeful takeaway from this conference could then be even one person or a small group can create a meaningful change, even if it might look as a small step forward. It's apparent that post-pandemic and climate crisis still reverberates through our lives and addition with the political and geopolitical upheavals around us, this might also prompt us to think in a different way and outside of the box of what is permissible. So, uh, and I'm sure I speak also for Linda, who's been moderating the first day of this conference, that we hope that both of those two days showed you at least some new ways of looking at issues surrounding gender inequality and economy and the workplace. Because remember, even a small step can, uh, can f help foster a bigger change, bigger change. And I hope you enjoyed today. And if you decide to join Sweden uh, during their presidency, I uh, hope you enjoyed the time as well. And before we say final goodbyes, I have one last, uh, invitation for yet another conference. Uh, it will be taking place tomorrow in the French Institute, Institut Francais. I think I'm, I, I've done unit one on Duolingo, so pardon me for trying. Um, and uh, it will be called Gender Equality as a Task, Youth and Economy and Reflection of Czech Presidency. It will be taking place in Czech with simultaneous English translations. translation. It will be more rooted in the Czech context. So if that's your uh, interest, uh, consider attending. We will also be having uh, a few guests from today and yesterday present. Alexander as well, and also Sharka Humphrey or uh, Maria Rodriguez uh, and Ki Beom Kim, among others. So, yes, uh, gender equality is a task. Uh, I believe you can find it on the Facebook page of, uh, uh, I don't know what's your English name, I'm sorry. <laughs> for it, for uh, just equality, Jan Rovnost, the Facebook page. And that's all for me. Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. And I hope to bring home something interesting with you. Thank you. Outside and coffee.